Last night, I was watching that 70s show reruns, eyes heavy and mind in a daze. I was starting to fall asleep when I awoke to what I thought was a loud thump by the patio door. The chocolate chip cookie I was halfway through slid off my hand, somersaulting down my torso, as this noise brought me to an awakening twitch. Just an animal, I thought, or the house settling. Eric Foreman is so goofy. Donna is always out of his league. Eric is lucky. I like this show. Back to sleep. Thump. This time from the ceiling. I shrieked. What the hell is that? This time I sit up, with upright posture like I'm ready to focus on any miniature detail that strikes my senses. I turn the kitchen light on, just out of a general state of fear, without really any concern about anything being in the kitchen. I check the back deck for the thump from before. That's super weird, I think. Nothing else happens, I start to relax. I'm not really worried at this point, but still a little on edge. I'm a college student spending the summer at home with my parents, working in downtown DC. They're at the beach. I'm alone in this rather large house. It's 10.36 PM. The door knocks. Seriously? I think. Now again, if I were on the set of a horror movie, or had been watching something scary for that matter, I would have drawn an immediate connection between the thumping noise and the door knocking unusually late at night, but neither of these things applied to me at that moment. So I didn't. I was still kind of anxious though from those thumps, but when the door knocked, my attention immediately forgot about this noise and was likely nothing to worry about probably a salesperson or a mailman. I remember one time a few years back, a UPS man rang our doorbell at about midnight to drop something off. I was the only one awake, so this scared the crap out of me. Maybe it was something like that. The most likely scenario would be my buddy Frank, who considered coming over but said he was too tired. He can be a little spacey though sometimes, so I guess he could have changed his mind without telling me. I'll guess I'll go over there and at least tell whoever the hell it is that I'd like my privacy. Unless it's Frank, of course, who I will then remind how spacey he can be. A little weirded out by the situation, though, I grabbed the first thing that resembles a weapon. An old lacrosse stick. I hold it from the head with the shaft facing outwards like a lightsaber. As I turn the corner to the foyer, I see through the door a pair of skinny legs with odd worn slippers. All right, this is a little weird. That's definitely a skinny chick. Maybe she's confused trying to visit a friend and knocked on the wrong house. The house next door is about the same size. Doesn't really look a lot like mine, but I don't know what else it could possibly be. All of this enters my mind in the matter of seconds between my footsteps in the kitchen and the doormat between the front door and the rest of my home. As I stand between the large modern door and whoever the hell is out there, I lean my lacrosse stick on the ground behind me so this stranger won't see it. As my hand floats hesitantly towards the doorknob, I hear a voice coming from the other side of the door. No clear words just light whispers. I assume someone must be with the slippers girl because I haven't even opened the door yet. And as far as I can tell, this person hasn't even seen that someone is home unless she's talking to herself. That thought didn't calm my mind at all though. My hands stopped frozen in midair, about halfway between the rest of my body and the door, like I was about to do some weird robot dance move. I wait for several seconds, disturbed by the odd synchronization between my movement towards the doorknob and the voice outside. I wait longer. No voices. I take a deep breath. It's through my nose and out through my mouth. Knock, knock. I open the door about three quarters way, quickly, 
like a toddler anxious and curious to discover the monster in their closet. I stick the right half of my body out, facing two dark feminine figures on my porch. The first thing I notice is those beat up slippers. I look up from there, my head and neck tilting upwards to see the rest of her. Straight black hair, uncombed, matted in different directions. She looked sickly, shaking in the cold, with a hooded sweatshirt and tiny khaki shorts. She's about five foot three, looks to be about 13, staring straight forward, which for me, at five foot nine, standing on a raised surface above my lowered porch, is at my pelvis. In the dark, I cannot make out the features of her face, but could tell that something about her was awkward, the way she stood there off balance. Her neck tilted to the left side like a chewed up overused doll. Before I can react in any way, I observe her partner, about a half a foot behind her and to the left, a noticeably younger girl, maybe nine years old, but with about an inch over her sister, wearing a ragged, dark blue shirt, black pants, rain boots. She had similar black hair, though didn't have the same bizarre demeanour as her older sister. I look down at these two girls, and have no idea how long it had been since I had opened the door. Have they said anything? What do I say? This is too weird. Uh, can I help you? I muster out, in the tone I typically use to talk to kids, but with an undertone of chill to my voice. I stutter some when I'm nervous or excited, and here, I could barely make out a word. Hello, sir. Please, we are cold, and would like to use the phone. The younger one says that, her head facing straight forwards. Her tone, it was like nothing I'd ever heard before. It was feminine, sure, but each word left her mouth fully independent of the other one, like they were just words being spit out of a machine and placed in the correct order by a third party. Almost like a robot. But she was clearly human, a young girl I'm speaking to, yet somehow very, very off. She didn't sound her age. She sounded at least 14 or 15, but she looked no older than 10. Why did she speak to me and not the older sister? What's going on? Is her older sister shy? Mentally handicapped? Am I dreaming? And what does this mean about using my phone? It was like she was speaking of a script and mix up her question. Did she mean to ask something else? Not sure how to respond to this arbitrary question I manage. Ah, uh, well, I'm not sure what you're asking. Are you two lost? First, nothing. Just stares, straight forward, directly ahead, as if with no visual awareness. Then, the younger one. Please, sir. We are alone, and need to call home. Let us in. Her response, with the same monotone voice, didn't really answer my question. It was like she was speaking without any concern over it. Just when it was time for her next line, and the last part, let us in, like a command, completely separate from her prior polite candid request. Trembling in fear, confused, with a strong sensation telling me something was horribly wrong, I said, Well, uh, I'm sorry, but I cannot let you in my house. You'll have to stay here while I grab a phone and call for you. I couldn't leave these two kids stranded out here. But I knew. Something in the pit of my stomach just told me I could not let them in. I was scared out of my mind. The two just looked straight forward, not responding. And suddenly, the older one, who has yet to move or say anything, changes her expression completely. She squeezes her fists as they shake at her sides as if in great pain, and without moving her pale face or neck, makes a smile. 
showing her teeth all at once. They were sharp, inhuman, like an animal's. At this, I make an obvious, loud scream of terror. The younger one notices my fear and looks up at me, and her pale face, her eyes, blackness, pure black, no clear iris or retina, like two black marbles. I then noticed her silent, smiling older sister's black eyes as well. A grotesque nausea floods my stomach, closing in on me, choking me. I am frozen. I do not manage a scream. I can't. I am lost in fear. My entire body speeds up, tingling, numbing. I lose myself. And finally, after what feels like several minutes, I let out a noise of horror that I don't think I've ever made. As I close the door in front of me, and retreat to the safety of my home. My body is still shaking. I stand, crying, trembling in the front of the door. I need to reach my cell phone, which is in the family room. I can still hear that 70s show in the background, which brings some relief, but it sounds off now, foreign, almost like another language in my fearful state. I need to call the cops. I can't let them in. Get out of here, I yell while banging on the door in an attempt to scare them off. Undiscernible sounds come from the other side, like animal cries or barks. It doesn't sound like the younger girl. I know it isn't. It's the older girl. The silent, mentally off one. But I can't fathom this. No. I need to reach my cell phone, but I can't move. I can't lose track of them. I can see the slippers in the side window. I know she's still there. More animal noises from outside. I scream, yell, bang my lacrosse stick against the door. Anything I can get out of my tired lungs and muscles. I felt like I was being attacked by a grizzly bear. I was in full on survival mode, doing all I could to scare them away. But any noise I made was matched by the older girl, with her disturbing barks and screams that to this day haunt my dreams. Then, from the other side of the door I hear a muffled, We just want to call our mother, from the younger girl. Please, we are scared and alone. Let us in. Let us in. That last part, let us in in the exact same candence, twice over, like a recording. Please, let us in, like a chant. Let us in. Let us in. Let us in. The younger girl continues, each command louder and more assertive than the last one, as the older girl's noises matches her demands. I wait for any sign of safety of this horrible nightmare coming to an end. I continue screaming at them until finally it stops. The noises, the chanting, gone. The slippers are gone. I look out my window, sprinting legs, the older girl running the speed of a male track star, but her legs twisting over each other like a circus freak. This is so screwed up. I see her trail off catching up with the younger sister, who must have given the orders to leave while she strayed for a minute or two barking and screeching and yelping like a Neanderthal. I watch as the older sister finds her younger sister waiting on the other side of the road. They stand there, not looking back at my house, staring straight ahead the other way, like they are waiting for something, someone. And suddenly, a large, wiry figure walks towards them. Long legs and arms and lanky, inhuman features, with the shape of a woman, but far too tall and awkward in form, like one of those scarecrow-like animations from a Tim Burton film. This creature, this monster, leads them away into the night. I did not leave my front door the entire night. 
I didn't sleep and barely have since. Close family, my girlfriend and my friends want to believe me. They say they don't think I'm crazy, but I feel like they don't really believe me. This is actually so screwed up, whatever it is, whoever they are, it's real. They're like these subhumans trying to take us or have them join them. I don't know what it is. They create this energy of fear and terror, like nothing I have ever experienced. I lay awake at night, terrified of when I open my eyes, that that older sister will be outside my window, hanging from a tree, smiling at me, barking, waiting for me to walk outside, leave the house. I haven't left since. Update. It's been a few days now and I've managed to leave the house at the request of my loved ones. Each hour that passes, I do feel a little more safe. I know this sounds like something out of a horror movie, but it's so messed up and the realest thing I've ever experienced. This happened about 15 years ago when my girls were still small. Their mother had passed away very recently and the grief and pain were still very much inflicting every corner of our lives. It is so very difficult to move on when you lose someone that close. But I was still a father and tried my best every day to do what I could to keep my two girls happy and life ticking along as normal. The girls went to an after school club. Being the only parent, I needed them to stay late so that I could pick them up from work and establish some kind of balance without my wife being there anymore. This happened during the winter. It was a regular Thursday and I was just pulling up to the school. I got out of my car and picked up my two girls. During the drive home, we were making small talk and asking them how their day was. To any parent who has kids, you know that most of the time they'll reply with either something along the lines of school was boring. And when you ask the other question, what did you learn? They'll most likely say nothing, as was the same with my girls. However, today, one of them said something that really got to me. My youngest, Jane. Jane, who is about six at this point, says that she was playing in the playground with her friends when there were two kids who were outside of school, i.e. on the other side of the fence, who were supposed to be in school. I asked her what she meant, and she said that there were these two kids who were about 10 and 7, who were just staring at all the other kids, wearing these thick grey hoodies just watching all the children. She said that this kind of freaked her out a little bit and she was more pissed than anything because she thought that they should be in school. Because of course, as a six year old, other children in school means only two things. One, that they're being bad or two, that if they're not in school, why should she be in school? Oh, clever Jane. Anyway, I kind of brushed this off and pushed it to the back of my mind, not really thinking about it and trying to focus more on what I was going to cook the girls for dinner and wondering if there were still any leftovers from the night before. We get into the driveway, I close the front fence and in we go. The girls do their homework as I start preparing dinner. After a pretty regular evening of eating, homework checking and TV time, we're all sat on the couch, pretty much exhausted. By this point, it's about 9pm. And I am shameful to admit that I was starting to doze off in front of the TV. It was some kid show the girls wanted to watch. And it had successfully put me into a very deep sleep. The girls were running around. And I hear knocking but I assume that it's just them playing. So I kind of close my eyes and get comfortable on the sofa again. After a few minutes, 
it definitely sounds like they're talking to someone. I press a button on the remote, and it tells me that it's already 10.15pm. Shit. These girls shouldn't be in bed. I turn off the TV, rub my eyes, and slowly start to get up. That's when my ears tune into something. At the door, the girls are talking to someone. Apparently, someone wants to come in. I rush over to the front door, because I've already told my girls never to open it for anyone and to always ask me. Why the hell have they done it this time? They should know better. I rush over and look down. Thank goodness it's still closed. But through the window, it's very clear to see that my two girls are talking to these two hooded figures. They're not particularly tall, and I instantly assumed that they were children. I got a very nervous feeling just standing there, and I asked my girls what was going on. Jane was quick to pipe up. These are the girls from the school. I told you, Dad. I'm asking them why they weren't in school, but they just want to come in. This is a bit weird, I think. And then Emma chimes in. Dad, I'm scared. Don't let them in. I tell my girls to rush upstairs and go put their pyjamas on and get ready for bed, and that I will deal with this. Obediently, they both run off. I look down and ask them what they want, hesitant about opening the door. Why are two kids awake at this hour, without their parents and wandering the streets? Part of me wanted to open the door, invite them in, get them warm and call their parents. But there was something just so strange about this whole situation. I can't even describe what it was, but there was a palpable feeling of dread within me. Something which should not be akin to two small children. Suddenly, the taller of the two speaks up. Excuse me, sir. We need to come in. We've lost our mummy. And we're so cold. Okay, I reply. Well, do you know her phone number? Perhaps I should get in touch, and she can come and collect you quickly. There's a pause, and a brief silence. It's almost as if they didn't hear me. Please, sir. We need to come in and call our mummy. Uh, okay. Do you know her number? I'm sure we can figure this out. Still no reply. Still eerie silence after I ask for her number. This is beginning to feel extremely dodgy. I'd read a story in the newspaper that people put these child baskets in the middle of the road and leave them as bait for people to come out of their car and then be attacked or abducted, or at least get their car stolen. I wondered if this was a similar situation, where children were knocking on doors in the middle of the night for unsuspecting parents to open their doors and then be the target of some attack. This was definitely giving me creepy vibes, and I was now more adamant to not open the door. I told the two hooded children as a last resort that if they wanted to, they can go around and open the back door and sit on the back porch to be safe, but I didn't want to let them in, and they could only do that on the condition that they gave me their mother's number, or I'd have to call the police and have them taken to the station so that they can find out where they belong. When I said that, there was silence again. Please, Brian, we need to come in and use your phone. We're cold. The window on my door is completely transparent. Not one of those funky windows that you can't see out of properly. And when the tallest of the two looks me in the eyes, her eyes are pitch black. Keep in mind that we have a porch light, and it's very clear to see that there are no whites to her eyes, no colours, no nothing, just two pools of infinite darkness staring up at me. I start panicking. This is otherworldly. This isn't right. I start to stutter and tell the two hooded children that I'm sorry I couldn't help them and to try another door. I quickly close the blind to our door window 
and walk away. I go upstairs and check on my girls. Both of them are in bed, trying to fall asleep, but they can't. Just like me, the tapping on the door and the calling of my name is getting quite chilling. The way my bedroom is positioned, I can look down my window and see directly onto the porch. And there they are, both looking straight up at me. I think this is insane. And I call the police, telling them that there are two children who have been dropped off or left or abandoned or something, and that someone needs to come and collect them. The person on the phone asks if this is a prank. And when I tell them that it's not, she says that someone should be there soon. It took all of 20 minutes for the sirens to start rolling down the road. I kept looking at the two hooded figures, on and off during that time. The moment I heard the sirens, did they start walking away. The police reached my house, and I saw them walking into the distance. I ran down the stairs and pointed in the direction that they just left in. The police quickly gave chase but never found the two hooded figures. They asked if I was joking or not, as they weren't really sure if this was a real call. And that's when my youngest comes down the stairs and says, No officer, daddy's telling the truth. I saw them outside the gates of school, and then they came to my house. This little detail really got the officer, as he said that it sounded extremely dodgy. He patrolled the area and assured us that they'd keep a lookout to make sure that they didn't come back, and that if they did, to call straight away and to never answer the door. To this day, I'm unsure whether this is some kind of paranormal or unexplainable event, or perhaps a sinister plot on their parents' part to maybe rob the house, or worse, take me or my girls. I honestly don't know what to believe. It was only years later that I heard of other people who had encountered children with pitch black eyes, and it made me wonder if they are perhaps something a bit more supernatural than I originally anticipated. Nonetheless, I never do want to meet them again. This didn't happen to me, but to both of my parents. My mum was a teenager and was at the lake with her family. She was around 17. Her brother of two years younger, their two cousins, and their two St. Bernards were there also. They were all walking along a paved path in a campground type area. The dogs suddenly started losing their mind, trying to run back the way they came which was in the opposite direction from the cabin, but they wouldn't leave my mum and uncle. They weren't on leashes, but one of them actually bit my mum's shorts and began pulling her backwards like a bad comedy movie. That was totally unusual behavior, as both dogs were extremely loyal and rather protective, but were generally pretty chill and friendly. They were all just standing around and laughing at the dog's weird behavior, not understanding what was going on. Then my mum says it seemed like they all looked up at the exact same moment. One of the dogs started to whimper and cower like it was absolutely terrified. All four of them looked up at the trees to the right of the trail in front of them and saw a Bigfoot. It was extremely close. This was near dusk. It was maybe eight yards away and mind blowingly huge. My mum guessed it was anywhere between eight to 10 feet. And all four of them are adamant to this day that it was nothing like a bear and nothing else it could be compared to. The creature was staring at them just inside the tree line as it crouched down when they looked. Not like it was trying to hide or about to pounce. My mum said it was almost like a person who was trying to greet a dog that was shy. The moment was really brief. Then it straightened up 
and crossed the path into the trees on the other side, eyeballing them the whole way. My mum says it didn't put off any antagonistic or threatening vibes, more just wary and almost forced casual. Nothing to see here move along. Not that that stopped my mother and co from being absolutely terrified. As soon as they unfroze and coaxed the dogs to carry on, they all booked it back to the cabin. When they told everyone about it, some of the others, a few of her uncles, her other brother, and another cousin, went back around to look. The dogs absolutely refused to go near that path though, and would freak out whenever my mum or her siblings tried to go in that direction again for the rest of the weekend. My mum is an extremely rational person, and doesn't believe in supernatural things generally, and she is not a person who ever exaggerates or bends the truth. So there really isn't anyone I would trust more in a first-hand account like this. Now, my dad. Not as honest and grounded as my mum, but with his own strong moral code about some things, and also not an exaggerator nor a liar. He is an alcoholic, so he did lie about stuff all the time, but he isn't the type to make up stories like this. My dad was an avid outdoorsman, and this took place before his alcoholism surfaced. There are few people as well versed about the area as him. He knows the woods, the animals, the weather and the vegetation, and he can calmly identify the screams of cougars, dying rabbits, or deer, all the native birds, and anything else that one might hear in the woods around here. He is also a very calm, unflappable person. I remember a time when I was around 10, when we were out hunting, and he calmly pointed out a cougar that had been stalking us for several miles. It took me forever to spot it, even with him describing its location. After that, he forced me to continue on, rationally explaining the cat's behaviour in a regular level of speaking tone, knowing we weren't going to come across any deer. Anyway, about 15 years ago, my dad was hunting one of his usual areas. He was alone, which was typical for him. He was about four miles in from the logging road where he parked, and the sun had just barely come up. He was heading towards a creek that was always kind of the central starting point that he and we used when hunting that area. He was wandering around, looking for a sign and finding absolutely nothing recent, which is very unusual in this area, when he heard what he described as the most utterly terrifying noise he's ever encountered. Not having heard it myself, I might not be describing it accurately, but from what I remember he said, it was multi-tonal, as if two to three voices of varying pitches were screaming in disharmonic unison. If they hadn't gone up and down in pitch, and started and ended simultaneously, he would have thought that there were several different voices. Every hair on his body stood on end, and he said he was overcome with a horrifying feeling of dread. The voice? He said that it had individual pictures that were rather human-like, and it screamed for longer than any human lungs could sustain. He estimated well over a minute, and it did not pause, nor did it happen again when it ended, and that the way the sound reverberated gave him the impression it came from very far away, but given the ear, splitting volume that didn't make total sense either. Anyway, he decided to get the hell out of there. The conundrum he faced was that the sound came from the same general direction as his truck. He told me that he rationalised that he would rather be found torn to bits by some mythical beast, than die embarrassingly from getting lost in the woods, as it may happen if he went in the other direction. But also part of him was afraid he was misreading something, and that it was the sound of an animal in pain, which he couldn't stand the idea of, and if he did come across it, he could either help it or put it out of its misery. The last thing he told himself before heading back to his truck, 
is that if it was a hunting cry, the animal who made it was most likely sprinting in another direction. And unless it ran into him, and his 0.30 head on, they would probably not meet. So he headed back. He sprinted noisily, figuring that there were more of whatever that was out there, and that they already knew he was there anyway. He said he carried his rifle rather than slinging it on his back as he normally would have, rounded a chamber and safety off. This, more than anything, is a testament to his fear. My dad was the biggest gun safety advocate I've ever met, and I'm a hunter safety instructor, so that's saying something. About a mile from his truck, he came across an area, I picture a clearing, but I can't remember what he said, that smelled horrific. I remember him saying it was a mix of garbage and decay, and several other things as well. He was covering his nose with his shirt to get through, and he came across a pile of extremely fresh deer guts. That wasn't the sound of the smell that he would have known, but he said they were in a pretty neat pile, and it was at least two animals worth. It was guts and legs that looked to be almost torn off, not cuts, but no head or carcasses or pelts or anything. There was a good amount of blood smeared around, but no puddle, as would be typical of an animal that bled out by another hunter. He said that he took a little while while looking around, as he's a passionate anti-poacher, and was looking for evidence about what was going on. But that's about the time that his brain clicked, and came to the conclusion that he may have interrupted Bigfoot's lunch, so he broke the hell out of there. He got to his truck, and didn't take his pack off or even buckle up until he was off the mountain. I remember listening to him telling me and my brother the story, when we got home from school that day, and being baffled. I've heard stories of black-eyed kids over recent years. Some of them are just downright creepy. I'm a sensitive. I do my best to be aware and focused. So when slash if I'm in danger, or loved ones are in danger, my intuition goes on red alert. With that being said, I'd like to share something interesting. During the most recent New Year's Eve, my son, myself, and my fiancé had a quiet night at home. We watched movies, made dinner, and my son went to bed fairly early, since he was only five. No wild party. We were marathoning watching Netflix, while laughing and chatting in the master bedroom, well after midnight. At which point there was a confident, yet creepy, solid knock at our front door. We live in the country. It's a bit more remote, and all of our neighbours were friendly enough. But they wouldn't have knocked that late, as it would be perceived as rude. Our jeep was parked in the garage, so it wouldn't be related to a car having the lights on or anything. I'm listening to this, because that happened once. The keys to the jeep in the house were securely hung in place. The fun time we were having quickly shifted to an odd feeling of confusion, coupled with unusual terror. It was really odd. We aren't fearful people. We simultaneously checked our smartphones for anyone stopping by and announced nothing, except a few well wishes from friends due to it being New Year's Eve and all. I got up to stretch, and my fiancé made sure I wasn't about to answer the door. Hell no, I said. We laughed uncomfortably. I joked with him saying, because you're going to do it. I teased him. He scowled and smiled, knowing full well he would have to normally. Why were we so on edge? We both remarked how odd we felt about the knocking and the late hour. In fact, we didn't budge from the master bedroom. Neither of us felt good about checking the door, and figured whomever it was had the wrong house. Then another knock. We were getting agitated, 
and that strange feeling of terror was back, strong as ever. I've never felt that way about someone knocking on the door before, nor have I not felt safe to answer. It was really odd. I'll paint a more clear picture. Good neighbourhood. Our front porch light bulb needed to be replaced, so it was dark as hell out there. I thought it was really weird that someone would be standing out there in the complete pitch black darkness for three minutes knocking like that. I mentioned this to my fiance. The peephole would give us away if we stole a look, since lights were on throughout the house. We didn't dare check. Why? That senseless feeling of fear was disabling. It made it so two grown very capable at defending themselves adults were essentially cowering in fear after two knocks at the front door late at night. What gives? It took about a half hour, but I eventually felt a lot better, no longer afraid, and felt that whoever it was had left. I checked the front of the house through the kitchen window. No cars, no neighbours, no parties just the calm sound of crickets. I proceeded to open the front door after listening to make absolutely certain that no one would surprise me, like a drunk ex-boyfriend passed out on the porch or something equally hilarious. Satisfied, I opened the front door. It was quiet. In fact, it was too quiet. No sound at all. That's odd. I had a feeling instantly of being watched. From where? Who? What? I got the chills and shut the door, then armed the alarm system. I thought to myself that if they came back, we can call to report suspicious activity to the police. However, it then occurred to me that we wouldn't get through. It was New Year's Eve after all. Awesome. Right? Even to me, it sounds like I'm overly paranoid and getting spooked for no reason. I would think the same had it not happened to me. When the second knock took place for a split second, I thought, oh crap, what if, regarding the Black Eyed Kids stories I'd read. Mainly it was the remarkable senseless fear we felt that tipped me off. My son slept through it. No, I didn't share this epiphany with my fiancé at that moment. We were too terrified to make any noise. He's legitimately a skeptic. He doesn't know anything about the BEK, and I wasn't about to go into it at the time. He shared there was no way in hell he was answering the door, and I thought his reaction was odd. Especially since he didn't know any of the stories. During this ordeal, the doorbell wasn't used at all. What's strange is that the only light in the porch area would have been the illuminated button of the front doorbell. Why wasn't the doorbell pushed? There's no porch light out there. It had burnt out. It was at a height which needed a ladder to be reached. During the busy holidays, we hadn't gotten around to replace the bulb yet. It was on our to-do list of things. It was moved to the top of the list after this experience. It was super late at night, and I've lived here for eight years. As an example, the only time our door was ever knocked on super late at night was a friendly neighbor letting us know, and this was months ago, that I had left my truck door open when we had unloaded groceries. He announced himself as he was knocking, saying who he was and why before we even reached the door. We were grateful for his concern, and that this was the only time it happened. It's a good neighbourhood after all. What's interesting is that with my previous knowledge of the Black Eyed Kids, that occurred to me during this experience, so I stayed put. There was no way I was going to check out who was there, just to be certain. It's more important to express that the immense fear I felt was paralyzing. I truly feel for anyone who has the displeasure of experiencing a black-eyed kid. If that isn't what was on the porch, then it was something equally as terrible. 
it's also important to share this tidbit. I'm not a person who's normally fearful of much. Honestly, there is danger in just about everything. However, that doesn't stop me from my daily adventures, and I'd rather enjoy life than live in fear. I'm a streetwise female who is always aware of her surroundings, as well as a survivor of a home invasion as well. Interestingly enough, when someone tried to rob me years prior, they were discovered in my kitchen when I was getting a quick glass of water before bed. We hadn't even been home for two minutes. I kept a breeder in the fridge to keep cold filtered water. When I opened the fridge, the light illuminated the kitchen well enough so that I could see the man standing on the kitchen corner. As unnerving as that was, I wasn't afraid. Fight kicked in versus flight. All I did was look straight at the man and say, get out. I walked towards him with purpose and he fled. I wasn't harmed. He ran from the house. My then boyfriend, back then it was someone I dated a few years ago, was amazed at my bravery. I've been trained in self-defense, have taken martial arts for years. So there you have it. Sometimes people fall on hard times and take desperate measures to rob others. And that basically was someone looking to rob a house that they thought was empty. I surprised them and they fled. With this experience that I've described, my instincts were going nuts. It was so terrifying that I wanted to share this with the community as a helpful way to warn others. If you have someone or something knocking late at night and it's followed by a similar feeling of overwhelming dread, simply trust yourself. Do not go near the door, nor could I, no matter what. That dreadful feeling was so pronounced, our instincts are there to keep us safe. So trust that feeling. It's there to keep you safe. Don't second guess yourself. We have since installed a security camera and restored the porch light. I was 12 years old when this happened. I didn't believe in the paranormal or anything until this night. At the time, I was living with my aunt and her kids in Jacksonville, Florida. There was this huge rainstorm going on outside that night, and at 3am all the power in the building completely went out. I wasn't afraid of the dark, so I slept in the dark. But I was awoken by the sound of my cousin, who was screaming for me and my sister to wake up and come downstairs. Being the kid I was, I didn't understand why he would be screaming for us like he was, and I was four to five months older than him. I didn't fear anything, but he always acted tough. My cousin was around six foot tall and was screaming like a scared child. It would have made sense if me and my sister were scared, because we both lived in a state we didn't know. I slowly started waking up, aggravated by being awoken by someone screaming downstairs. I could slowly hear the front door open and knew my cousin was standing in the doorway by how close he was to the stairs. Me and my sister share a room where our room is close to the stairs that leads to the first floor of the apartment. I rolled over from facing the wall to where I would be facing the closet that has sliding doors to access the clothes. I peek out the window to see it's raining so hard, the world looks grey. I hate the sound of thunder, and I fear seeing lightning, but I love the sound of rain. It always has a way of calming me when I was either stressed or waking from a nightmare. I used to have horrible dreams of being attacked by people with no faces, not a blank face without eyes or mouth, but the face is completely black with no eyes, no mouth, no nothing just emptiness. It was always scary to have the dreams that I'd wake up crying. I stare out the window just thinking of how I wished I wasn't there, and glance towards the dresser with the clock showing 3.05am, when something caught my eye. I glance towards the closet, where I saw a black shadow figure standing in the doorway. It stood as tall as the door, and I noticed it had red glowing eyes. 
I admit I could have imagined it. I do have mental health issues from abuse sustained by family and PTSD, psychosis and borderline personality disorder as well as hallucinations. So I could just easily conclude that it was all in my head. And the hallucination episode was making me feel uneasy. But then I realized I couldn't be imagining. Because when I imagined, it usually only stayed for a second or two. But this thing persisted and was still standing in the doorway. I was just laying in my bed staring at this creature, just thinking why it was here and what did it want. I was frozen in my place by fear. I tried collecting enough courage to ask what did it want. But before I could raise my hand towards its face where a mouth would be. But like I said, the only thing there were its eyes. This creature was telling me not to speak. Could it read minds? Did it know what I was going to ask? But my mind was set. I wanted to know if I was going to die. Before I could ask this creature, it shook its head and I relaxed. But not long after, it disappeared. I laid in bed thinking almost on the verge of tears. You could call me weird, but the situation made me sad. I couldn't help but think that death himself had wanted me, but then probably didn't. Because no one wanted me. That's how I felt at the time. I got out of bed after collecting my tears, telling myself who cared who wanted me or not. I prove it to everyone I didn't need them. I wiped my tears, woke up my sister telling her to come on and that our cousin was scared. After we leave our room, I look back to see if maybe it was behind us, but the room was empty. When I went downstairs, I asked my cousin if he saw anyone in the house. And to my surprise, he just said he didn't like the dark. We went to a neighbor's until our aunt's mum came back home. About 6am, she comes home to find the apartment empty and find us at a neighbor's. She didn't want me hanging out with them because she didn't like me making friends. A week later, I was running down the stairs with my little sister behind me, rushing to the bathroom to take a shower and get ready for school. We did this every day, racing to the bathroom to see whoever made it first would get the shower. Out of nowhere, this huge black dog with red eyes jumped out at me with its huge scary teeth showing an open maw. I fell backward and landed on my butt, causing my sister to stop laughing and ask what was wrong. I asked her if she saw the dog that jumped on me and she looked puzzled and surprised. She didn't see the dog. How didn't she see it? It was clearly in front of me and I felt the dog. I touched its fur when it jumped at me. It felt so real. It scared me thinking she didn't see it. She looked at me as if I were losing my mind. My sister got the shower first. She won the game. It was only fair. I couldn't stop thinking about the dog. When I got to school, I rushed to the library before it started to see what the dog was. The searches I could look at said it was a hellhound, a very scary dog and nothing that you ever want to encounter and that people say that they are ancient demons that serve as the heralds of death. According to the legends, seeing one leads to a person's end. Sometimes it's said to be once, other times it requires three sightings for the curse to take effect and for the victim to fall. These factors make the hellhound a feared symbol worthy of the name bearer of death. After reading the article of the creature, I feared I was going to meet my end. Seeing the death guy, I told myself I didn't want to die anymore. And then the hellhound. Who knows? All that I know is that I'm afraid of black dogs. I grew up in the great Pacific Northwest, in the foothills of the Cascade Mountains under the shadow of Mount St. Helens in Washington State. It is a land full of myth and legend, mostly from the natives, but a lot from the old timers, the loggers, the trappers and hunters. One of my father's oldest and dearest friends, now passed on, was a local Native American who was one of the oldest of his nation. 
He was an adult before most of the towns in the area were settled by white people. His name was Charlie to us. I'm sure he had another native name, but I don't recall what it was. Charlie used to sit us down, kids and adults, and tell us stories. Some of the stories were tribal legends. Some of them were things he saw happened to him in the woods. And some of the things said by the other men and women of his tribe were the fur trappers and miners of the late 19th century. As I got older, I began to realize that Charlie wasn't pulling our legs on some of these stories. He genuinely believed them. And a few of them happened to me as I would wander out into the woods and investigate. The most obvious and easiest to prove was the ridge light or mountain lights. Charlie called them by different names and the locals to this day still tell some of the stories about them. The lights, according to Charlie, had existed as far back as man had. They would appear around the mountains on clear nights and zip around in the air. One of the local legends said that the lights were the spirits dancing and playing. I first saw the lights when I was a kid and several times since then. To me, they fit the exact description of a classic UFO. Lights that appear to be some form of aircraft that flew in manners impossible for current aircrafts. Incredible speeds and course corrections. The last time I saw the ridge lights was in the mid 90s. I have noticed a distant decrease in reported sightings of them since then. But for a while, the western foothills of the Cascades were a hotspot for UFO sightings. Speaking of UFOs, it goes on a bit further than just seeing the lights. When I was a young kid, I woke up in the middle of the night in the little farmhouse we lived in to bright lights outside. They were multicolored and flashing, like police cars, except I seemed to recall they were green as well. I curiously and unafraid walked out of my room and into the living room, the kitchen, and eventually my parents' room. All the while in all the windows, there were these bright lights. I tried to wake my parents up, but they were sound asleep. I shrugged it off and went to bed and woke up in the morning. When I brought it up with my parents, they dismissed it as a dream. I accepted that especially because one odd part of my story, I couldn't wake my father up. And he was a Vietnam vet who normally woke up at the sound of a mosquito farting. This story would have ended there if not for our drunken neighbor. Some years later, when I was a teen, I was talking with the now dead neighbor's granddaughter. The neighbor himself was known as a drunken lout and storyteller of the first order. Anyway, his granddaughter was telling me about how he used to tell these crazy stories. And one day he swore up and down that aliens landed in his field and visited him in the middle of the night. I laughed and said, I think I would have seen that as our yard is connected to his field. She agreed, saying something like, you and your parents would have noticed a bunch of red, green and blue and white flashing lights in your backyard 10 years ago. To be clear, I am not saying I saw a UFO land near my house. I'm saying I have seen lights that match the description of the lights on the supposed spaceship reporting to have landed in my unreliable drunken neighbor's yard. And then there's the big myth of them all. Sasquatch, Bigfoot whatever you call him. Do I believe he exists? Absolutely. Even though I consider myself a man who puts science before superstition. Why do I believe in him? Because when I was a child, I saw the footprints. My father even had a plaster cast of one. That was my first encounter. The prints were on the edge of a bed creek in a small ravine on a piece of wild property my father owned. We found them when surveying the property with a hunter friend. 
my father insisted it must be Bigfoot, to which the hunter scoffed, and said a man could have made those prints. To demonstrate, this six foot six, 250 pound hunter climbed on a nearby log, took off his boots, and jumped down into the semi soft ground. His foot size was 12, and made about a half an inch indent into the earth next to the other print. The print was a hand longer than the hunter's, and at least one and a half inches down. It also had an odd big toe. It was splayed to the side, kind of like a thumb. My dad consulted Charlie for advice. Charlie told him to leave Sasquatch be, and Sasquatch would leave us be. Charlie also told us how he knew when Sasquatch was nearby. Nothing else would be, and sometimes you could smell him. He said that if you could smell Sasquatch, it was time to get the hell out because he was a hell of a lot closer than you wanted him to be. Anyway, as the years went by, we learned to just hike out of the woods if they got dead quiet and we didn't see any signs of other animals. Only twice do I think I smelt him. Both times it was a heavy, musty, almost moldy odour, like old sweat or wet dog. The second time I was with a girlfriend. This was in my teen years and I record something else that Charlie has said. Never go into Sasquatch territory with a woman who was on her period, because he could smell that and would track her, according to legend, to find a mate. It was the first time I ever asked a girl if she was on her period. She was. Needless to say, quite embarrassed to answer that it was that time of the month. That was when I told her we needed to leave now, and we started out of the woods. We both swore we heard sticks breaking and branches rustling behind us the entire way out. And we both had that terrifying pit in your stomach you get when you know that something is watching you. I grew up in a small coastal Oregon town. Nothing ever happens and it's always quiet. From my childhood home, you could look one direction and see nothing but ocean in the distance, and in the other, forest-covered mountains. You would hear stories from old people sitting around campfires after a few beers that had loosened their tongues about the stuff they'd seen on the ocean or out in the deep woods. Loggers would frequently tell about Sasquatch and footprints the size of a man's chest, or the howl that sounded like nothing else a seasoned hunter had ever heard. I was a hard kid, hard life, hard attitude. I trusted no one, didn't believe anything unless I saw it myself, and none of these tales really did anything for me other than give me a little chuckle. I was a pretty poor kid, and had nothing but hand-me-downs and government food and stuff. So I learned, like many folk in the area, to supplement our food by foraging and hunting. I was probably around 12 or so, and I was on foot after about a three-hour hike into old forest growth, with just my dog and I going up to our Chantelier mushroom patch to pick for the day. Being that deep was not uncommon for a boy my age, as that was just what you did. No big deal. I was deep enough that the only trails were made by deer and elk, and I only knew how to get there by following a trail of surveyor ribbon that I had left on branches of trees. Deep enough that the moss and brush ate up all the sounds even your footsteps to the point a bird call would even echo like a siren. We were in the patch for a while, picking and stacking the mushrooms, just me and my rowdy German Shepherd slash wolf hybrid, and I had a good stack with no slug marts or mushy spots. Rowdy usually slept the whole time I picked, but this time he was pacing about, 
But I didn't pay much attention because sometimes he got a wild hair and just did stuff differently as his nature. All of a sudden, while I was picking, he ran up to me and whined like he did when he needed to pee in the mornings and began circling me. And that's when I felt it. You know the feeling when something is definitely watching you, but you can't tell from where or what it is? The hair on my neck stood up and my skin started tingling, and that flight reaction in my gut told me to run. But I didn't. I listened. I didn't hear anything except Rowdy whining for a few seconds, and went back to filling my pack. A bit quicker now, as I had seen cougar and bear feces in the area, and bears will eat mushrooms. By this time, Rowdy was visibly freaking out, and it was freaking me out. But I was determined to go home with my harvest. All of a sudden, Rowdy just took off and left me. He had never done such a thing. And then I heard a branch break behind me. Not a twig, a branch, and another. I ran as fast as a white boy alone in the woods could. And then the thing was pacing me. I could hear it off to my right and then behind me again to my left. I knew that there was a clearing up ahead where I could follow the power lines down and ran even harder. When I got to the clearing, Rowdy was there with his hackles raised and growling as he started barking and snarling like he could have a while back. Then it screamed. It wasn't an elk or coyote or anything I've ever heard before. And it was so loud and guttural and close, I screamed back out of pure fear and nearly pissed myself on the spot. The dog and I started running again, and I didn't hear it following this time. We made it home, and I told my parents, and they laughed at me for being a little wuss. Said it was probably an elk or something, and to stop being silly. So I dropped it and only told the few people that shared similar stories with me. We went back a few months later, and the whole patch had been rooted up, like an elk got to it, with their racks. So maybe it was just that. But I don't know. Today was a day like any other day. I woke up at noon, got showered and dressed, cleaned out my room. My mom was out shopping, and my dad was up on some land we owned trying to clear out the brush. My younger sister was at school. Today, she had a choir concert, so I was searching for something nice to wear. The day felt unusually long. It's almost like I was anticipating something. I felt nervous, but peaceful. My mom came home. So we went for a walk with our dog and talked as usual. She told me shopping was lonely without me. I had a bad day yesterday, so she wanted to let me sleep. I put my arm around my mum and hugged her with a smile. We talked about my fears of college, which I'll be starting in August. We talked about things we're looking forward to during the holidays. We talked about things that make us sad, things that cheer us up. Songs we like, old musicians, and how much Steven Tyler looks like Mick Jagger. And had a laugh about that. I couldn't seem to shake my feelings of anxiety. A few hours had passed, and my sister had come home. We were in her bedroom so that I could help her figure out what to wear. I finally found a pretty white top and a pair of silky dress pants. She got dressed and left for her concert. I felt stressed, so I decided to stay back to get a shower before I left. I was standing in the shower, warm water hitting my back and the steam relaxing my entire body. I was stepping out, when I was suddenly filmed with an overwhelming sense of dread and worry. I felt dizzy and disoriented. I tried to shake the feeling. So I blow dried my hair and put on my dress. I heard knocking at the front door, but I felt sheer terror. I didn't want to go downstairs, and I didn't want to answer the door. 
My dog started growling and barking and scratching the door. Hello? I need to use your phone. At this point, I was obligated. I ran down and opened the door. I left the storm door shut and locked it, so I was able to talk through the next scene. It was a girl of about 13 with long blonde hair, wearing a bright blue hoodie and torn jeans. Next to her was another little girl of about six or seven. She had short blonde hair and little above the shoulder length and was wearing a pink dress with flowers on it. Both were looking down, so I couldn't see their faces. Uh, hi. Can I help you girls? We need to use your phone. We're not from around here, and we lost our mother. She's worried. The older girl mumbled, still looking down. I felt compelled to let them in, but I wasn't willing to risk anything with that horrible feeling I had. I'd heard so many stories about the black-eyed kids and researched into it a lot. These stories had made me terribly curious and intrigued me greatly. I know too much about them to deny what's happening. You can use my cell phone, but you can't come in. We've been outside all day, ma'am. Please, we're cold. It was a warmer day. It was in the high 50s, Fahrenheit, compared to what it had been. I can't let you in. If you need to call your mom, I can let you use my cell. That's it. So I stepped out onto the porch, not knowing what to expect. I noticed the older girl get more tense, like she was starting to get angry. Please, mom. We are very tired and have to call our mom. Her tone had gotten more aggressive. It was unsettling. Look at me. What? No. We need to use your phone. I said, look at me. If I can't see you in the eyes, I won't let you in. They both looked up at me. They had large, dead black eyes. I felt as if my soul was being drawn into them. My heart sank. These were the things I'd read about. The soulless, violent children were standing in front of me. I felt so compelled to say yes. I almost felt guilty for being so aggressive in my response. But I knew what they were. I can't let my compassion overtake my common sense. What are you? I know those eyes. What are you, children? What do you want? She said nothing. She tilted her head and stared directly at me in the eyes. It felt almost hypnotic. It's a feeling I can't really explain. They looked at each other and smiled. Ma'am, we're two girls who need to call their worried mother. Please, this is the last time I'll ask nicely. She kept that twisted smile on her face and just glared at me. I backed into the door, opened it, and slammed it in their face. I locked the door and walked through the house in a panic, making sure all the windows and doors were locked. I heard knocking on the window. I backed myself against a wall and peered over just enough where they couldn't see me. But I could see them. I crawled onto the floor to another room. They then came to that side of my house and began knocking on the windows of the room I was in. It's like they could see me, no matter how much I tried to hide. In a panic, I called the police. This is Carlisle's daughter. I need someone. There are some girls knocking on my windows and they won't go. I told them I can't let them in. Please come. I'm scared. My dad is good friends with a lot of the cops so they know who I am by my father's name. My dog was still barking furiously. I'd honestly forgotten he was even there. His barking shook me back to reality. The cops soon arrived and told the girls to leave. They actually walked away. I wasn't sure what to make of that. I've never heard of them just walking away. Maybe they have their own fears, cops being one of them. The cops looked shocked when they first started talking to the girls, but eventually got them to leave. I realized I was really late to my sister's concert, and in a panic, grabbed my shoes and everything and drove over to the school. 
On a positive note, the concert was great. The Coralie sounded beautiful, and I was terrified to go home after. With reason, of course. I truly cannot make heads or tails of my experience. Let me tell you, though, if you ever run into these children, you'll regret answering the door. Whatever you do, don't look into their eyes. It's like they have some sort of hypnotizing power. You'll feel dizzy and sick. You'll never forget your running with these inhuman children. I've had several Bigfoot encounters within the city limits of Tampa, Florida. I know it sounds unbelievable. I've lived near the Hillsborough River, and after my encounter, I looked at my area on Google Maps. To my surprise, there is a lot of wooded area along the river leading out of the city. For about two weeks straight, I felt like I was being watched and stalked. Monday through Friday, I left my studio apartment at 5am to catch the bus to work. I walked to the bus, and it is on an extremely dark road that is alongside the river where the entrance to my apartment complex intersects with this road that's wooded, if you know Florida forests. Then you know it can be quite intimidating, because the forests are very dense. I walk left from my community onto the only sidewalk. Across the street is the waterfront to the river, with thick vegetation. I walk about a quarter of a mile before there is a house on the riverside on the street. On the left, I do walk past two fenced-in apartment communities. I wanted to give you an idea of the terrain. When I felt like I was being stalked, I took off my Bluetooth headphones to listen. I heard the occasional twig snapping, and this reassured me that my spidey senses were correct. This continued for two weeks. I was a nervous wreck. I had been listening to Bigfoot encounters on YouTube for a while. I was learning all that I could about them, but I never thought that I could be stalked by one in Tampa. Until Monday, on the third week, I felt like I was being stalked. As soon as I turned left onto the sidewalk from my complex, do I hear a loud rock clacking. I don't listen to my headphones in the morning anymore. I pretended to be listening to them, and when I heard the rocks striking each other, my heart skipped a beat. Then I heard a familiar Bigfoot yell that I heard from a YouTube video. By this time, my heart was pounding. I almost crapped myself. I almost turned around, but stopped myself. I wanted to run so badly. Somehow I was able to barely flinch. I kept my stride, acting like I didn't hear a thing. I thought I was going to have a heart attack. As if what happened wasn't enough, I literally felt a rock land behind me. It must have had some considerable weight to it, because I felt the impact through my shoes. I was terrified. I thought I might not make it to the bus stop. Reflecting back on the encounter, I believe there was more than one during this. There might have been a juvenile there as well. They get aggressive when people get too close to their offspring. And the next morning about the same time, I could hear it having a massive temper tantrum. It was letting out the loudest and longest yells I've ever heard. I can only imagine how homeowners felt. And after that, I couldn't walk that way anymore, and had to take a different route to work which meant I had to catch the bus an hour and a half earlier. Every once in a while I would walk that way, to get some smokes from the gas station at around 10pm. I'd bring my pitbull, and we would both hear the occasional twigs snapping. She kept a constant eye over by the river. Sometimes it looked like she was staring at a thing, and wouldn't budge. She's an extremely protective and fearless dog, and has never backed down from anyone, other than thunderstorms, or Bigfoots. I am an avid outdoorsman in Eastern Canada. I have seen some strange things out in the bush, and I will share them with you today. I live in New Brunswick, 
and for those wondering, it's right above the state of Maine. Every June, my friends and I will take a deep trip into the Appalachian Mountains for a few weeks, just set up camp and enjoy the few weeks until we return to busy life in the city. I am by no means a novice outdoorsman, so I know what to bring and to definitely bring a gun. I never go into the woods without a firearm, because you never know. Boy, am I sure glad I brought it. The day finally came for our trip. We all met at a local Tim Hortons and made the journey to the car lot to store our cars for the next few weeks we would be gone. After arriving at the lot, we unloaded and made sure we had all the right gear for the trip. Food, water, fire making supplies and firearms. The place where we would be camping is about a five to seven hour hike into the deep forest, far away from civilization. The hike to the camp was uneventful, but after the six-ish hours of leg workout we finally got, we then set up our tents. The first night was a typical night, full of drinking and playing card games. After about five hours of that, at around 10 p.m., we all went to bed. I woke up at 2 a.m. still a little tipsy from our party, and a couple of hours before, and went outside to take a leak. I stumbled out drunkenly, and found a good tree about 15 yards away from the tent. Midstream, I hear this whooping sound. Almost sounded like a juggalo concert, to be honest. It caught me off guard. I'd never heard anything like it. It scared me even in my drunken state, and I hustled back to the tent as quickly as I could to wake up my bodies. I shook them awake, and they were starting to tell me that they were still drunk and confused, asking me who the hell I am for waking them up. I proceeded to tell them that I heard a weird sound and told them to help me check it out. They basically all told me to piss off. I wasn't very happy by this, so I grabbed my gun and went out and fired a few rounds to scare off whatever was making that sound, and hoping that my buddies would use this cue to come out to see what was wrong. After unloading those few rounds, the whooping stopped. I stayed up for a few more hours before passing out from sheer exhaustion. The next morning, we all barely remembered that night we were so wasted. Being sober now, we all talked about it and what I heard last night. No one could explain what the sound was or the cause of it. The day went smooth, and nothing out of the ordinary happened. The next night is what really did it for us. After about 9.30, we were sitting around the fire when we smelt this horrific smell. The only way I can describe it is if you were to mix piss, shit, and vomit together, and multiply that by a hundred. We all looked at each other, trying to figure out what the origin of this awful smell could be. It lingered for about 10 minutes and then went away. We couldn't explain it. None of us farted or anything, so we had no idea what it could be. Soon after that, we could hear leaves being crunched and twigs snapping. To us, this was no big deal. The forest can make all sorts of scary noises, so we ignored it. The time came for bed, so we all crawled into the tent to doze off. Maybe 20 minutes after going to bed, we felt and heard something hit the tent. We all immediately sprung out of our sleeping bags and reassuring each other what we just witnessed. Was someone messing with us? We grabbed our guns, loaded them and quietly snuck out pointing them in every direction, and calling out, Hello? Who's there? Show yourself. There was no response. I called out again a bit louder this time, when all of a sudden we got pelted with rocks, and things being thrown at us. We fired our weapons into the air, and it stopped all of a sudden. We were all frantically looking around, scanning the forest for any possible movement, but there was none. That stench came back, 
We fired more rounds off this time into the trees, and the whooping started again. It was closer. Whatever it was, we didn't want to find out. By this time, we were all basically crapping ourselves due to pure fear. We had never experienced anything like that. I saw some movement in the distance, finally, to which, after spotting, I yelled at it and fired. This strange scream or roar blared our eardrums. It was sort of like a sound that if you were to combine a hyena and lion, would make. It lasted for only a few seconds, and the sound of branches being broken and leaves getting stomped on faded away into the distance. We stayed up the entire night and headed out at dawn. Whatever it was, I am positive it was some kind of Bigfoot. I am also 100% sure that I hit it with my shot. I never saw its features, so I could never really identify it. But I will forever wonder what that thing was that night that scared us to the bone. Needless to say, we will not be returning to that spot again. I am an atheist, but I'm open to the ideas of ghosts. However, I can't explain what happened. Summer of 2017, I'm a 19-year-old male working in Dubrovnik, Croatia, as a booker for a tourist company, and a bartender-slash-animator for the same company's pub crawl boat party. My employer was paying me, and my three roommates, accommodation. But this cheap guy placed us in a village called Uskople, which was 21.3 kilometers away from Dubrovnik. This village had six houses, not including our own, and less than 15 people living there. The biggest issue was that no bus passed there since it was atop a hill, so you needed to hike around downhill to this other village where the bus stop was built. The hike down to the village was 45 minutes, half hour on the road and 15 minutes in the village, and the bus ride to Dubrovnik was another 45 minutes. One night I was working alone, and was coming back about 2am from the boat party, making my way back from the bus stop to our house. I stepped onto the road on the left of the village, with the bus stop, and turned on my phone flashlight to light the road, since there were no street lights. This was vehicles only, no pedestrian path, and I turned on the flashlight since this area was known for venomous snakes and I wasn't willing to deal with that. I'm halfway there when all of a sudden I heard a howling behind me, a wolf-like howl. First, there are no wolves in this part of Croatia, and secondly, my father is a vet, and we've had a lot of dogs, mostly German shepherds, so I know what a big dog sounds like, and this dog's voice was deep. I slowly turn around and find this massive dog staring at me, roughly 20 meters away, growling, barking and howling, but not moving a muscle. I followed his example and stood there for half a minute, just analyzing the dog. I had never seen this breed of dog. It must have been twice the size of a German Shepherd, let's say as large as a Great Dane, but its head was definitely more similar to a Doberman or Belgian Shepherd. Also, it was completely black. There was something completely off about this dog. I'm not going to say it had an evil aura, since I don't believe in that sort of thing. But I simply had the feeling that this was something of a demonic dog, or something like that. I can't explain it, but for some reason, I felt like the least of my worries should be this dog biting me. Take note, at this point we were standing in the middle of a road, in the middle of the night. There aren't a lot of cars that pass here at this hour, but I wanted to get off the road either way. After staring each other down for about a minute, I slowly, without turning, make my way to the house. After I walked about a hundred meters, the dog stopped the growling, turned away and left. I picked up the pace, and was just only a few minutes away from home when I heard a growl. This time it was meters away from me. I turn around and the dog was less than three meters away. If I had made a single step, I could have reached out and petted him. Once again, this dog was growling, but not attacking me. 
It did the regular attack mood posture with its tail up, legs widened, ears up and teeth showing. We stared at each other for another minute. The dog didn't move a muscle and neither did I. The beast was as large as me, at least, and weighing at least 60 kilograms, and was definitely as large as a Great Dane. Once again, I slowly start making my way home backwards, and the dog doesn't let up, but it doesn't follow me. I made my way home, and the barking and howling stopped as I closed the door behind me. I tell my roommates about it, and they say they'd never heard anything, even though the dog was relentlessly barking and howling just 200 meters away from the house while they were awake with no TV nor radio on in the room. I asked the neighbors about the dog. They said the same thing, and added that no one in the village owns a dog. My roommates and I agreed that we should never let anyone go home alone at night because of this scenario. We went on to investigating the surrounding area and never found anything. The reason this baffles me so much is because the temperature there can reach over 40 Celsius, and that's in the shade. There's no natural drinkable water source, and there are no animals there except for snakes, small lizards, birds, and insects. The dog, even if it were able to stand the heat, could not feed, and that large of a dog must need a lot of food nor could it find water. There was no way that dog could survive in the wild. And there wasn't anyone nearby or in the next village who owned a large dog. The neighbor was kind enough to ask around, you see. The dog seemed to have come from nowhere, and we never have heard from it again, which is probably for the best. This happened a few years ago at my parents' house in a small town in Wayne County. Anyone that knows the area knows some parts are very rural. Well, my parents live right in town, not far from the center of it, but in a weird spot. The town has only maybe 500 people in the town limits, and it's surrounded by farmland and forests. They live right near the railroad tracks and canal and the backyard is pitch black at night because the street lights don't reach back there. The yard backs up to a walking trail and woods. It's actually pretty creepy back there after dark, even though it's a two blocks from downtown. The night this story takes place, it was extremely dark. I think it was a new moon or a moonless night and it was overcast to boot late summer or early fall, so it was pretty dry, no mud to capture any footprints. My parents, brother and I, were talking in the living room at the front of the house, the part of the house facing town and light. The house is kind of long and skinny, maybe 30 by 40 feet wide, but probably 120 to 150 feet long. As we're talking, the family dog stood up and looked around and started to growl really low. He was a yellow lab of about 90 pounds, half deaf and blind from diabetes. Overall, he was a really chill dog. He'd never barked at other dogs and very rarely barked at people. That's what made this so odd. His cackles went up and he started barking towards the back of the house. There were at least two closed doors before you even got to the room where the back door is. The dog is now like full on berserk, barking at the closed door in the hallway. We opened it and followed him to see why he was going nuts. We get to the door to the back room and are now worried someone has broken in. But when we opened it, Marley shot straight to the back door, jumping and barking and snarling, making sounds I've never heard this big baby of a dog make. I opened the back door and he tried to bolt out. He was going to attack whoever or whatever was there. Me and my parents step out on the back porch and close Marley inside. He still sounds almost rabid. 
We wait for a second for our eyes to adjust, because the backyard is pitch black. We see a silhouette, maybe 40 or 50 feet away, standing at the edge of the yard, right near the railroad tracks access road. Now, to say this was big is an understatement. It was way over six feet tall, probably closer to seven and a half or eight, and extremely broad. I'd think it was a potential burglar that we caught sneaking up to the house, if it wasn't so colossal. My parents to this day swear it was a black bear. Officially, according to the DEC, black bears don't live anywhere near this area and haven't for a long time. Also, the size of it would have been a record-sized bear. The reaction of my dog going nuts doesn't seem like what a bear would do. After we had put Marley inside, it just stood there, upright, for about two minutes, before we decided it was best to go inside, as the hairs on the back of our necks were standing up. The reason it freaked me out was even at the distance it was at, you could hear it breathe, deep, raspy breaths. It sounded like it was breathing right next to my ear. They were slow and steady, not like someone who was out of breath. It wasn't like they were trying to make their breath sound loud. It just was. I immediately went to find a flashlight, but when I got back outside, whatever it was was gone. No tracks, no fur, just a huge silhouette that was too big to be a person, but acted unlike any wild animal that I have ever seen. It was a quiet and damp night in Akata, California. In this small town, not much happened. Low crime rates, everyone knew everyone. If there was a roaring party meant to happen, every team in town knew. And if someone wasn't from there, we could smell it. It was oddly dark tonight, completely devoid of light. My friends and I decided to play on our personal playground this morning, and we've been out here ever since. It looks and feels to be close to midnight. I've always been good at telling time just by looking at the moon. Tonight was a full moon, actually, my favorite of the bunch. Marie, come on, we're gonna play hide and seek, my best friend yelled from across the field. I didn't even notice that I had been staring at the moon for quite some time now. Well, we had a hill that connected the playground and the woods, and if you went into the woods, you'd soon find yourself in your neighbor's backyard, so the hill created a wall between us and the neighbors. As kids, we made a sort of dare to see who had the guts to jump the wall and into the playground. I of course always won, well, me and Vanessa. Vanessa is my best friend, when closer than Tom and Jerry, honestly. Coming, I respond to Vanessa, and our friend Jackson, who's only about a year younger than us, which makes him eight. I take one last glance at the hill, which is the way to climb the wall, but my attention is immediately drawn to something much more peculiar. I see someone's feet climbing the hill, but I can't see their face due to a branch that drapes over the hill. At first, I think nothing of it. People always climbed the hill as a shortcut to get to our neighbors on the other side. But for some reason, this wall was different. I couldn't take my eyes off this strange figure. By this time, Vanessa and Jackson noticed my staring and came over to see what I was so intrigued with. Within a blink of an eye, the human feet that were once visible are now paws. Almost on instinct, I push Vanessa and Jackson behind me slowly, backing away towards the entrance to the house. Guys, run! We all start sprinting towards the door. I struggle for my keys, but they drop to the ground, and I hear a gasp come from Nessa, and I look up to find a creature staring right at us. I secretly slip the keys to Vanessa while I stand in front of them in a protective stance. He's big. His dew-coated fur is like coal, 
Drew escaped through his mangy sharp teeth, disappearing into the prickly grass. His eyes, while well, they were gazing right at me. It felt like he was taking a piece of my soul, and they were blood red. But to my own surprise, I wasn't afraid. I felt drawn to him, paralyzed almost, like I never wanted to leave the spot I stood in. But my protection for my safety of my friends got the better of me. You want them? You're gonna have to go through me, I said confidently. He saw the challenge in my eyes. I half expected him to lunge at us, but he never did. He stood there, his crimson orbs never leaving my brown ones. He was drawn to me. I could see it. I could taste it. I felt a tug on my Backstreet Boy shirt. And before I knew it, I was standing facing Vanessa and Jackson in my own home. They looked terrified to say the least. Everything was in complete silence now. We were safe. But in my mind, I was still out there gazing into those eyes. I wanted to see them again. And I turned to look in the window, but it was gone. There was a sting in my heart, a feeling of disappointment and rejection. My friends and I ran upstairs to calm ourselves down. We all got permission from our mums in order for them to sleep over until the morning. The next day, my mum walked Nessa and Jax to their house, and we never spoke of that night again. Ten years later, and I still fall asleep in the cold of night, dreaming about those crimson eyes. I've had more than one and my fair share of paranormal experiences and came face to face with multiple weird things since then. I'm now 20 and did some deep research as to what I saw. The only thing that describes my experience to a T is the Hellhound. This experience takes place about four years ago at my parents' house. The house has a fairly long driveway that goes down to the mailbox. We live in a wooded area with a forest on both sides of the house and behind as well. On top of that, we live on a dead end road with only a few houses. So it's quiet, dark and isolated at night. It was about 10 at night when I was on my way down to get the mail. A few months before this, my mum had told me about strange sounds she heard in the woods behind the house early one morning. She said that she was taking the dog out to go to the bathroom and she heard what she described as a hooting sound like a monkey in the woods. My mum is one of the most level headed and down to earth people I've ever met. She does not believe in anything paranormal, but she told me that she immediately thought of Bigfoot and it freaked her out. So fast forward, back to the night of getting to the mail. I get to the end of the driveway and I hear this sound coming back from the woods down the road and it's something I've never heard. I've lived here my entire life and I've heard everything that lives in these woods, but this was something that I have no comparison for, except a howler monkey with a deep voice. It made a kind of ooh and ah sound, like it was hooting, that increased in volume and intensity with every hoot. It reminded me of the primate house at the zoo. I immediately thought of my mother's experience and hauled ass back towards the house. Right before heading inside, I paused again, listening to see if I could hear it. And I heard the same sound in the woods right in front of me about 20 feet in. I can't tell you how much of a chill went down my spine. Whatever it was had followed me through the woods without making a sound. I ran inside to get my brother who believes in the paranormal, but is skeptical of most stories. I told him to get out here and that he needed to hear this. You just have to hear it. He rolled his eyes and followed me out. So my brother and I stood in the front of the house, listening to this thing hoot and yell in the woods in front of us. Suddenly, another one answered from across the yard in the woods on the other side of the house, and the trees began shaking in the exact same area. I can't express to you 
the size of these things just by listening to them. They sounded huge, and the one behind the house was violently shaking the trees. My brother is very stoic and not easily impressed, and he stood there silently with me listening to these two things shouting at each other in the woods, and after several minutes, he quietly said, What is that? I whispered back, I have no idea. My mum later told me that she said it scared the crap out of him. That's the only time I've ever heard this sound, which to me gives it more weight as a strange experience. I've had people try and tell me that I heard two owls. I have lived in the woods my entire life, and I've heard owls many times. This was not an owl. I used to enjoy going for early morning walks as the sun came up. I don't do that anymore. A couple of days ago, my grandma told me a story that happened to her. When she was around eight, she lived in a small house with her sisters and parents. It was in the middle of a large field, and it had trees surrounding it towards the back. There was only a narrow dirt road that connected them to the outside world. One night in May of 1964, she and her sisters had went to sleep for the night. She woke about two hours after she fell asleep and got the horrible feeling that she was being watched. They had a small window six feet up on their wall in the room. She turned and looked at it and saw two glowing eyes. She got really scared, so she woke up one of her sisters. Her sister began to freak out, and she hid under the blanket. They sat there until the eyes left the window. The next day, they told their mother about the incident, and she didn't believe them. That was until they investigated the outside. There were enormous footprints leading to the window, and then back out into the woods. From that point on, my grandmother and her sister were not allowed to play near the woods. A couple of months later, they heard from a neighbor who lived about seven miles away. He said he lost a couple of cows. He had no idea where they went. There was no blood or body, and the fence was undamaged. It was almost like something had just carried them away. After she told me about this story, I think she may have had a Bigfoot encounter. My dad had a sister, who I never met. She passed away before I was born. It's a very touchy subject, as you can imagine, within the family. But one time, my grandma was getting drunk and brought up this story on her own. I asked my father about it after, and he begrudgingly nodded his head and said that we think it's true, but to not speak of it. The tale goes like this. Apparently, many years ago, my father and his sister were out on the land as they lived on a ranch. They were doing their duties, and his sister chose to stay out a little longer to finish off some work she was doing. She must have been around 17 at the time. My father, a bit younger, went in because he was hungry, and she never returned. After about two hours, my dad was thinking it was weird that she hadn't come in yet. So he went out looking for her, and when he found her, she was crying by a tree. The sun had almost set, and it was dark, and he was asking her what was going on. She explained that just as she was finishing trimming some bushes, did she look over to come into the house and put the shears away, when she saw this huge black dog with red eyes. She said the dog easily came up to her chest and that upon seeing it, she froze in fear. The dog glared at her without a sound for a few more seconds and just like that, evaporated into a smoky mist. His sister couldn't take it and she freaked out, ran and hid behind a tree not knowing what to do, and too scared to go home, as that would mean passing where it had disappeared. 
My dad told her not to worry, that it was probably her imagination. But deep down, he didn't think she could imagine something so vivid that would terrify her so much. He brought her in, and they tried to forget about it. But apparently his sister liked to share, and told my grandmother and my grandfather what she'd seen. My grandfather, being a very stern man, said that it was nonsense, that she obviously imagined it, and to put it at the back of her mind and not give it any more thought. My grandmother, however, was a bit more compassionate, and although she had a hard time believing her, that some strange dog appeared out of the mist and then vanished again, she did her best to make her feel better. Not three days passed, and again, my dad's sister was out on the land doing some yard work. My dad was right next to her. They were chatting and having a good time, when all of a sudden, she seizes up. My dad looks at her with a start, and in the distance, he sees the very same black dog. She is frozen in fear, and as the dog disappears, she lets out a horrific yell, and then her face contorts in agony. My dad doesn't really know how to describe it, but her eyes nearly rolled to the back of her head and she collapsed. They rushed her to hospital, and they found out that apparently she had an unknown aneurysm in her head, and it had burst, killing her. They don't know if the sight of the black dog was enough to cause it to burst from the stress, or perhaps it was an omen of her life coming to an end. As you can imagine, it took a very heavy toll on the family. My grandfather started drinking again, ended up going to rehab, and never ended up leaving as he took his own life from the grief. My grandmother is still about, and doesn't often talk about her daughter, but I know she still hurts from it. My father has never let us have a dog, for obvious reasons. This is a story passed down to me from my late father. He was an avid storyteller, and often told this story when he was drunk, but never when he was sober. This happened to him when he was a young lad, maybe 40 years ago now. He and his girlfriend at the time had gotten into a huge fight and broken up. His friend Jack told him the only way to console him would be to have a night around the campfire in the woods. On their way there, Jack drove my father into the woods and parked at a spot where no one else was stationed. They took their gear in through the darkness and found a spot about 20 minutes away from where they'd left the car. It was quiet and a peaceful night, with the moon shining brightly over their heads, illuminating the canopy of trees above them and the foliage beneath them. Their spot was quite bare, perfect to start a campfire and to set up their tent. They whipped out the beers and started drinking and having general merry conversation. My father confided in Jack all the things that happened to deteriorate the relationship. And as a 20 year old man, he was quite upset. Jack did his best to reassure him. And as the beers kept flowing in, the night seemed to get better. And the thoughts of this girl breaking my father's heart were slowly being washed away by the alcohol. I believe my father said he was around on his fifth beer. Although truth be told, he usually does lose count. He said that something was off. That whole evening, they'd been happy by the roaring fire, eating their snacks, drinking their alcohol with the pleasant little buzz of the forest in the background, the chirps, the noises, the general background hum made from everything in the forest. It was almost like the sound had been turned off. One moment it was there, and the next, it was just their voices and the crackling of the fire. 
it got very creepy. And it seemed as though the world was slightly darker again. They looked around and didn't see anything. There was no cause for concern. Not anything immediately apparent anyway. So they sat there, just seeing their surroundings. Like I said, the moonlight gave plenty of illumination, so they could very clearly see what was around them, but saw nothing. Why did all the sounds stop, they wondered. They sat there in silence for a little bit, debating whether or not it were important for them to do something, like leave, or if they should just stay, and that the animals are just being weird. Their thought process didn't take all that long. Not long after the sounds had disappeared, did a foul stench appear from nowhere. This was before the movie Shrek came out. No. My father compared it to leaving food to rot out in the sun and then having to take a good old whiff of it from up close. He said the odour was so pungent that it infested their noses and that they wanted to leave straight away. With all the weirdness that was going on, they were starting to get uncomfortable. So my father thanked his friend for making him feel better and they both agreed to go back to his house to finish off the last few beers and just to have a general chilled night. They started packing everything up when they heard something in the distance. They weren't entirely sure what it was, like a crackling, like twigs snapping. They thought it could be another person. Could another person smell that bad? So they yelled out and asked them to come forward, that they had beer that they'd like to share and to generally just have a chill night. No one stepped forward. The sounds stopped and they waited patiently awaiting a reply. They didn't get one, so they quickly packed up their stuff and started hauling it back to the car. They didn't hear anything on their run back, but just as they were driving away, the headlights illuminated something, what appeared to be eyes in the forest. The eyes, however, were far too high to be a person. They could see the outline of some kind of creature humanoid, standing anywhere between six to eight feet high, immobile. They drove away and tried not to think about it. The reason this incident stuck out in my father's head, it was because he was traumatized from breaking up with his first love. And then this happens on the same night. Talk about bad luck, double whammy. He never went into more detail than that, but I always wonder. Did my dad have an encounter with the elusive Bigfoot? It was the first Tuesday of the Pennsylvania deer season, December 3rd, 2013. I've always been an avid hunter and I would wake up very early in the morning to get into the woods before daylight. I would be in the woods by 4.30 in the morning having to hunt on state game lands meant beating other people into the woods to get a decent spot. When I got to the parking area at around 4.15, no one else was there. So I walked into the woods, not using a flashlight, but walking only by moonlight. I walked through a field into the tree line and started on my path to my spot. I came to an intersection in the path. One way went left and down the mountain. The other way went right. I went right because my spot was on the other side. Roughly 50 yards after making the right hand turn. I smelled what I can only describe as hot garbage. It hit me in the face. Like I mean hot dumpster juice in the middle of August. So I stopped dead turned on my flashlight, expecting to see piles and piles of garbage. 
Nothing. No garbage. Nothing dead. Just hot garbage smell. Keep in mind this is in December. It's cold out. High twenties to low thirties. So even if there was garbage, it shouldn't smell that bad. So I kind of thought nothing of it. I followed the path to my spot, which was down over the ridge from the garbage smell. Roughly maybe 40 feet down, that leads into a grass field where I would sit. I set up my seat, get settled in for about two minutes. That's when rocks started coming down the ridge. The first rock startled me, causing me to turn on my light again, scanning the field, hoping to see eye reflection of a deer, but nothing was there. I sat back down, another rock comes down the ridge. This time I stand up and go out into the grass field with flashlight and the pistol that I carry while hunting. I scanned again, nothing, and purposely waited in the field for about five minutes. Now I'm getting angry, assuming another hunter is messing with me because I'm in their spot. I sit down again. The third rock sounding larger than the others comes tumbling down the ridge. I don't get up this time. Not two minutes after that, another rock, not tumbled, but sounded as though it were thrown off the ridge and landed in the field. Screw it. I'm pissed. I gathered up my gear and started back up the trail to the ridge. I get on top of the ridge, scanning with my lights the whole time. Nothing. No eyes. No other hunter. I get to the spot where I smelled the hot garbage. Nothing. The smell is gone. Finally, it clicked in my head. It may have not been another person, possibly something else. I've heard other stories of people's Bigfoot experiences, a lot of which remark on how bad the smell is. Screw that. I all but ran out of the woods, and to top it all off, no other vehicles were in the parking area when I got out of the woods. This took place in Pennsylvania State Game Lands 229, outside of Tremont, in Shoyukil country. I later come to find out that a co-worker of mine had actually seen a bipedal cross in front of his car within two miles of my location, so maybe they're real. I don't know. But I definitely had an experience that I will not forget. It was the summer of 1986, and I had just graduated from high school. I was living in Vancouver, British Columbia, and my girlfriend and I spent the afternoon at Kitsilano Beach, suntanning. She had to leave early for work, so I stayed on the beach, alone. It was around four, and I was hungry. I walked up to the beach over an area called Spanish Banks. There was a concession out there, and I had a long line. It was an Expo 86, so we had a ton of tourists that summer, and the beach was packed. I placed my order, but was told that it would be a 15 to 20 minute wait for my food. I perched myself on a bench and proceeded to wait. For some reason, I looked across the street. The concession stand is adjacent to the road, a narrow two lane road, not the best for beach traffic. And the other side of the road is a forest called the UBC Endowment Lands, attached to the university. There was a guy walking down through the forest, which was also a steep hill. There is no sidewalk below, and it was a really dangerous place to try and cross the street. Not only that, it was an odd place to come out of. Imagine a steep hill with lots of bushes and trees going straight down a curb, and then a busy street. The second that I saw this guy, and I was far away at the concession stand. I had that gut-wrenching fear that everyone describes, even though he was far away. I could tell that he was grinning maliciously, fixated on me. He crossed the street grinning, and at that moment there were no cars, so he got across easily. 
He made a beeline straight to where I was, and went and sat on a bench and crossed from me. I'm not good with distances, but I approximate it must have been 10 to 15 feet. He was First Nations, a bit older than I was, maybe 1920. He had medium length hair and was wearing a white t-shirt and a red flannel shirt over it, unbuttoned. He was wearing jeans. I can't remember his shoes, runners of some kind. He was fairly attractive, but utterly evil. Malicious was the word that kept going through my mind. Now his eyes, they were black. No whites could be seen, but they were not shiny like all of the other accounts I've read. His were dull. The way that I described it to my boyfriend later was that they looked like scratched black plastic. They also gave me the feeling of when you look into a microscope of binoculars and you can see your own eyelashes squished against the lens. And it's almost spider-like. His eyes and his everything frightened me like nothing ever else had. He sat there grinning at me. He knew that I was terrified. And I knew that I had to pretend that I was not. I felt totally alone, even though there were tons of people around. No one else seemed to notice anything amiss. I felt as though knowing that this person existed made me hate being alive. The world would never be safe if things like him existed. I sat there acting totally normal on the outside, trying to keep it together because it seemed instrumental to my survival. I had no idea what this thing would do, but I felt as if my life was in danger. My food was ready for pickup. I got it, and then proceeded to go over to the payphone, and I kept my back to him as I phoned my boyfriend. I told him to get over to Spanish banks because there was a really scary guy here, and I didn't know how to get away. After my boyfriend hung up, I stayed in the phone booth, pretending to talk to someone. At some point, I had to get off. Maybe someone wanted the phone. And I sat back on the bench. And he stayed. Grinning. A minute or two before my boyfriend got there, he got up and sauntered away down the beach. When he arrived, he wanted to go after him. I grabbed his arm and told him that we had to get out of there now. I couldn't properly explain it to my boyfriend, just how terrifying that experience was. I still can never explain it properly. It was scarier than any murderer. It felt as though as if this thing could do something to you. It wouldn't just end your life. It would do something that would destroy or torment your soul forever. I've had a couple of other experiences that are slightly related to this, though different. I used to do ghost investigations with a foundation for paranormal research. So I was used to going into dark places and trying to come up with rational explanations. The stories about black eyed kids had intrigued me and I always felt a bit uneasy when thinking that they were real. What that could mean. So a coworker and I were having a discussion about paranormal topics and I thought about the BEKs this guy was a bit gullible and was a little spooked by some of the stories of my investigating adventures. I told him that I wanted to talk with him about the subject, but if I didn't, he might be a target for those dark forces and he'd have to agree before I tell him to alleviate any guilt of my part if something strange were to happen. He agreed. I told him about the BEKs and some stories I'd read over the previous years and then embellishing it and saying, now that I've told you them, you'll get some kind of visit within three days. He laughed it off and kind of didn't believe me, although I saw a nervousness on his face. Two days passed, and then on the third, I told him, today's the day, and he had actually forgotten all about it. And we laughed about it a bit, making woo scary ghost noises. So I go home, do some chores around the house, and then went upstairs to do some exercise. I was just on the treadmill at the time, and I was binge watching Friends on Netflix. The episode was almost over. 
and the TV sort of just faded out to black, and I thought maybe the power was acting up, or the TV just went kaput, when I heard the most sinister child giggling that turned into a sort of demonic high laugh, kind of half and half. There on my TV screen was a picture of a red-headed, freckled, 10 to 12 year old kid with solid black eyes. The picture was sort of zoomed in and turned on a slight angle, as if you had tilted your head to the side. It just stayed there, and I jumped off the treadmill and onto the sides of the equipment, and just stared at it with my mouth agape. The laugh giggled again, and then it faded out, and friends faded back in, and the end credits were about to roll, sort of picking up where it had left off. The whole thing happened in about 30 seconds. I couldn't sleep. I went over and over it in my mind, that somehow I got the visit from the black eyed kids, but not in person as one would think. I could only hear that demonic giggle laughter in my head over and over, and literally scared myself. I told my co-worker about it, and he then thought I was making it up. I scoured the internet for a photo that looked just like what I saw, and while my photoshopping skills are limited, I managed to recreate it. We were both very spooked. So a few years ago, I had a run in with the entities known as the Black Eyed Children. For those of you who don't know, the Black Eyed Children are beings that roam the night. They knock on doors and try and get into your house. When you get a good look at them, they look like they're from a different time period. Then you see their face. They have no eyes. Or rather, their eyes are so black, they look like they're not even there. Any encounter with them results in the most terrifying night of most people's lives. However, my encounter with them just falls short. For reference, I was 17 when this occurred. At the time of writing this, I am a 19, almost 20 year old, and I was working at an indoor water park that might have been referred to as The Puddle. I was a lifeguard, and was the last one heading home late one night. I was soaking wet and freezing, despite it being around 80 degrees outside. I got into my car and locked it, pulling my phone out for some music. I read a couple of messages and got distracted, and suddenly there was a tap at my window. I looked up and saw a couple of kids staring at me. I rolled the window down just enough to hear them clearly. What's up guys? Are you lost? I asked in a polite tone. They didn't really respond. They didn't really move at all. Finally, the smaller child spoke, and as he did, my heart dropped. The voice that came out of this child's mouth was deeper than my own. It was so deep that it sounded like Satan himself spoke to me. We just need a ride home. Could you let us in and take us there? I couldn't move. I was frozen in fear. Come on, mister. Just open the door. It demanded knocking again. As they were knocking, a car's headlights illuminated their faces. They had voids where their eyes should be. When they saw my look of horror, they grinned and started pounding so hard on my window that I thought it would break. I kept trying to start my car, but it wouldn't. Finally, one of the housekeepers of the hotel the puddle was built around came out to throw trash, and I heard them walking and went to warn them about the kids. When I look up, they were gone. Now this could have been a hallucination brought on by the amount of stress I went through, but it was very real for me. Anyway, my car ended up starting and I made it home in record time. Like I said, it's not the scariest thing that's happened to me, but it's up there. Let's just hope they don't find me again. Stories of the Alaskan Bushmen, or Tornets, 
have been told since the first humans crossed the Burring Land Bridge. In the beginning, the story goes the Inuit and Tornids lived peacefully in villages near each other and shared common hunting ground. The Inuit people often built and used kayaks for hunting, while the Tornids were unable to master the building of kayaks. They were very aware of the advantages of having and using one. One story goes that a young Tornit borrowed a young Inuit's kayak without permission and damaged the bottom of it. The young Inuit became very angry and stabbed the Tornit in the nape of the neck while he was sleeping, killing him. The rest of the Tornits feared that they too would be killed by the Inuit and fled the country, rarely to be seen again. Since that time, many stories have come out of the bush of hunters disappearing, later found dead and mangled, or never seen again. Apparently, hunters and the Tornids no longer peacefully shared common ground. Every spring, my family and the Panillo clan, a Hawaiian family we were very close to, would pack up and head to Willow for a week to fish for salmon in the Deshka and Little Sustina rivers. One particularly rainy and cold spring, my father, brother and I were pulling in salmon after salmon when a nasty, skunky, musty smell floated towards us. It suddenly dawned on me that most of the other fishing families had quietly and quickly disappeared. Mr. Panillo always fished with a shotgun by his side. My own father was always armed with a Colt .45, and now he unsnapped the holster and quietly told us to reel in our gear and pack up. Since we'd only been fishing for about an hour, and it wasn't anywhere near dark, all of us kids were a little bit confused, but knowing not to question our dads when they gave us an order, we did as we were told. I whispered to my dad asking what was wrong. He whispered back, bear. But I wasn't so sure. I had never smelled a bear like that. As we were crossing over the railroad bridge, I remember looking at some trees that had been uprooted and then stuck in the ground upside down. I often wondered why and how someone could do that. I learned many years later that it was a telltale sign of Bigfoot territory. I guess I'll never know if it was a bear or a Bigfoot that displaced us all from fishing that evening. But I do know that it was the last time our families ever fished that river. It was also the first and only time all the kids got to sleep or at least tried to, in the camp trailer instead of the tents. I'll preface this by saying that I have spent a lot of time with Native Americans, and their culture slash history is really important to me. My dad grew up on the border of a reservation in Alaska, and was adopted by a family that was Inuit, and I spent a good amount of time with a friend who is Lakota. At the time of this incident, a friend and I were leaving Standing Rock after being there for six weeks to drive home to Texas. We, for some reason, decided to go and see Mount Rushmore on our way back. And after being at Standing Rock for so very long, we had a sour taste in our mouths seeing American presidents' faces carved into the mountains that were straight up stolen from natives. So my friend decided that we should go to Wounded Knee. It was only a few hours out of the way home, and it seemed important that we go. Side note, it was about 11pm at this point, but screw it, I was planning on driving straight to Texas, and we should go to pay our respects, especially after Rushmore. Fast forward, GPS takes us straight to the main part of the gravestones and monuments, plus a bunch of descriptive signs. I've never believed in ghosts or spirits or any of that, but as we parked, I was seized with a terrible fear. I couldn't move, 
refused to get out of the car, struggling not to have a panic attack and get out of there, that kind of fear. My friend gets out of the car and goes to read the memorials. And I sit in the car literally paralyzed with fear and terror. I look out the window and see two giant black dogs with red eyes that look directly at me. All I could feel was this oppressive feeling that was almost a thought that we didn't belong there. And the word leave. We maintained eye contact as I literally started to shake and feel the most horrible feeling and sense of dread I have ever felt. Also for the record, I'm a really tough lady, so it takes much more to even ruffle me. I lay on the horn and once again, my friend returns to the car and I tell her that we need to leave now. I don't tell her what's going on. I just type Texas into GPS with shaking hands and start to drive away. Following the instructions, I leave taking a bunch of turns and roads I didn't remember from the way in. And after around five minutes, we end up right back at the exact same place of wounded knee that we were at. Right then, feeling legitimate and actual terror, and trying not to lose my mind, I tell my friend what's going on. She happens to be a hippie who believes in stuff like spirits and crystals, and she took me seriously pulls her phone out, and her GPS did the same thing. All I feel is dread. I cannot get those eyes out of my head. And I decided to trust my hound dog sense at that point, and just drove as far away as I could. My friend insisted we threw off all the jewelry we were wearing. And I drove in clammy terror for at least an hour before I felt okay to even speak. I still don't know exactly what happened. And it still unnerves me. I got goosebumps just remembering this. In 2013, I was homeless and living in the local women's shelter. The exclusive director of the place is a man called Dan. He was shady as hell, with the creepiest, sleaziest aura around him, and a long history of abusive behavior towards the shelter's clients. But that's an entirely different story. Most nights Dan left the shelter by 5pm. And he was virtually never to be found on the grounds past seven. But one October night, he was still kicking around at nine. A few of the other ladies and I were sitting outside just chatting when we saw him pull his car out of the back driveway and take off down the street, like his ass was on fire. His back tires spun out in the gravel before getting purchase. And that's how fast he accelerated. And just as his car disappeared, I saw an absolutely enormous black dog or wolf like creature come leaping through the brick wall where his office was. It took three long strides across the front yard, leapt towards the road Dan had taken off down and vanished into smoke. Everyone was quiet for a moment until I asked if anyone else had just seen that. One of the ladies said, Yep, and we hurried around to get back inside. I'd never felt so deeply and viscerally unnerved than I did that night. I draped so many blankets over my bunk that it was like a little cave, just trying to feel secure enough to sleep. Fast forward to December, we had a new lady in our room and was staying up past lights out to work on some small Christmas gifts. And while we were working, we were quietly telling ghost stories. I happened to mention what happened in October. And once I'd finished, two things happened all at once. The temperature in the room plunged. It was a little chilly back there because Dan was too cheap to turn up the heat, or even turn it on sometimes. But this was cold, like someone had opened the window. And the baby in the room next door who'd been dead asleep, let out the most blood curdling shriek I'd ever heard from her, like someone was hurting her and started screaming and crying so loud, she woke up everyone in the woman's shelter. To this day, I don't know what exactly I saw. But I've been left with the distinct feeling that it was evil, and attached to Dan in some way or another. And you know, it was always a joke that he'd sold his soul to the devil to be as untouchable as he was.
My mum has had many, many strange and paranormal encounters in her life, including meeting her own doppelganger as a child. She had many stories to tell me, and I've grown up hearing about them. The flying cups in her bedroom, the vacuum cleaner running by itself when she was a little girl. However, there's one that still baffles me to this day, and I want to know if anyone else has ever seen this creature or knows anything about it. Years ago before I was born, my mom had been staying at her best friend's house for a while. Her best friend was married, so her husband was also there, but he and my mom barely interacted with each other when she was there. He always kept to himself and still does today, as they're still friends. As my mum put it, she was parked in her friend's driveway, waiting for her friend to come out so that they could leave. My mum was alone in the car, fiddling around with some buttons and such, and she glanced in her rearview mirror. What she saw horrified her. In the rearview mirror, she saw a large black dog walking on its hind legs. Now I'm a very skeptical person of everything. So I asked my mum if it was just a random big old dog standing on its back legs and using the car for support. She insists that no, it was walking like a human did. It did not touch her car. It walked along the sidewalk like a human would. It did not once get on all fours and that it walked on two legs. She swears this and I can see by the genuine terror in her eyes that she's telling the truth. I asked if she saw the legs. She said as soon as she looked behind her, it had vanished into thin air, gone like a ghost. When she looked around, there wasn't a single dog or person in sight. That's not the scariest part, for me at least. My mum visited her best friend again, not just the house, she hates the house now, a few years ago and the subject of spirits came up. My mum told her exactly what she told me about the dog or whatever it was walking behind the car in her driveway because she never told anyone. Her best friend looked at her pale in the face and said, my husband told me he saw that too. It walked on two legs. Two people saw the exact same creature in the same spot at different times. I've heard legends of dogs and how you can see it so many times as a signal of fate or fortune. But what was that? Have any of you ever seen anything like it? I'm terrified because I passed my driving test recently. And if I see this thing, or anything remotely unnatural in my rearview mirror, I think I'll have a heart attack. So I had decided to go out looking for some mushrooms the edible kind. And it was probably about 20 miles on a back road, which is just a dirt road marked as a trail XYZ here. I found an out of the way spot to park my vehicle, where I know some good mushroom hunting can be found. After a little searching in a ravine, I found a good spot and set up a tent and built a basic campfire. I was out there two days before the incident. On the third morning, I got up to nature's call and walked off a bit to relieve myself. It was still pretty early, dawnish. I about tripped on this rock and it was huge. I didn't remember seeing it there when I went to set up camp. I got an odd feeling because there were similar sized rocks all touching each other. The reptile part of my brain was screaming. So I went and got my flashlight to check out these rocks. They formed as far as I could tell a perfect circle around my campsite. From memory, I'd say it was about a 15 to 20 foot diameter ring. I paced it off. The thing is, I could barely make these rocks budge. Sure, I could lift one, maybe just a few inches. But move them? No. They were about knee high. Some of them had to be in over a hundred meter range. In a moment of crystal clarity, I realized that if crap hit the fan, my vehicle would be found, but I wouldn't be. I don't think I've broken camp quite so quickly. I didn't even get the few mushrooms I had collected. 
I figured it would be better to leave them for whatever left me the ring of stones. I was such deeply troubled by this that I have not spent one night in the woods in the five or so years since this happened. A lot of people think I'm making this up, but it happened. I have my theories as to what it was. One, I can't talk about, because it has to do with Native American beliefs, of which I am one. But the other I will. As far as I know, Sasquatch has never been sighted in my area. I mean, we have the Fouquet monster, but that's a couple of hours south of me. I've heard some stories when I was younger around the hunting campfire that there is something big living in the mountainous parts of Arkansas. These were old men telling the story 20 years ago. They say in turn that they saw the creature or heard them in their youth. One even talked about hearing roaring around his hunting cabin and a loud crash. The next day, most of the young trees had been splintered or pulled up. So I 100% believe that there is something out there. I have three stories from my own friends who've had interactions with these beings. Firstly, in Eugene, Oregon, my friend Amy told me about her interaction with a BEK. And this is amazing because the BEK had black skin. It's the only example I've ever seen of this case. So, this being knocked on her door late one night and simply asked for water. Amy brought her some water in a glass. The being drank it, set the glass down and walked off into the night. All black eyes, of course. Secondly, my friend in Grant Pass, Oregon, David, had a classic experience in a car when two young boys with black eyes knocked on the windows and wanted in. He just got terrified and locked the doors and drove away. Now the third story involves my Aunt Rosie in Medford, Oregon. One day she gets the knock at the door and it's two little girls dressed like Little House on the Prairie and they've got the antique baby buggy with little dolls in it. My Aunt Rosie asked the girls if they were okay, and they asked for water to drink. My Aunt Rosie asked if they wanted to come inside. They said no. Could they just have some water to drink? She goes to the back and grabs two bottles of water from the fridge, returns, gives them the water bottles, and the girls proceed to guzzle the water down like hungry wolves. My aunt turns from the baby buggy to where she was doting on the dolls and sees them doing this and tells them they can just take the water with them. And that surprises the girls greatly. They said okay and wandered back down the long driveway. My aunt closes the door then thinks those girls could have been angels, reopens the door and they're gone, just gone. And this is too along a driveway for them to just disappear like that. Unlike other houses on the street. She asked around the neighborhood after that and nobody ever knew of the girls nor had seen them. I asked if she knew what black eyed kids were and she said no. I asked her if their eyes were normal and she said no, that they were all black. I lease a horse at a barn in a very rural part of Ohio. I'm close with the owners of the barn and have a key. So oftentimes I'll go to ride later at night after the lessons are done and I've finished my homework. I had a friend with me who was not a rider. She was just coming to hang out at the barn with me. The way the indoor riding arena is set up, there are large garage doors on each side which I had to open for some airflow. As I was tacking up my horse, I saw something dart across the open barn door and the end of the breezeway. I assumed it was a coyote and the aisle was lit up and the outside was dark, so it was hard to tell. I mentioned it to my friend and we walk into the area from the stalls 
and just start to warm up since my horse is older and it was chilly. The next half hour goes pretty smoothly. It's as I'm dismounting that I see the similar shape from earlier go fling past on the open garage doors. My horse starts nickering nervously and getting shifty, so I take him back to the aisle to one track. I tell my friend to go close the barn doors for the night. She says she doesn't want to go alone and is freaked out, so she'll wait for me to go with her. I untack and we close the arena doors. We walk back to the aisle to close the last door and right outside, there's just this massive dog. It was shaggy and came up to about my waist. I'm five at nine. Its eyes weren't glowing, but they were reflecting red in the light from the barn. My friend starts grabbing at me and pulling me back, but the dog isn't moving or anything, just staring at us. I know this sounds weird, but I didn't get a bad vibe from it. I come from a superstitious old world Italian family. So I'd think I'd have known if it had bad intentions. All of a sudden, it turns around and trots back to the tree line. My friend is freaking out, crying and begging for me to call her dad to come pick her up because she didn't want us leaving by ourselves. It has been a month now and I haven't seen the dog since, but honestly, the weirdest part of this story is that the other horses in the barn didn't freak out. If you know anything about horses, you'll know they sense danger and freak out if they think their lives are at risk. This whole situation is just super weird to me. I live in North Texas near a large wildlife refuge and a lake bigger than my hometown. One night, I had a fantastic idea to go down the long gravel road to a dock with a female friend of mine. I'm from Texas, so I usually carry, but opted to leave my gun locked in the glove box by the gate. About 30 yards into the trek, the road was about 200 yards to the dock, I hear an unnerving noise on my left. It was as if the earth itself growled and rumbled at me. I looked around frantically, trying to pinpoint the sound, but there was nothing. We stood still, waiting for it to resume. Instead, we hear just heavy footsteps, not crashing or rustling like a bear or a pig does, but heavy pacing. I turn to my friend and ask if she wants to go back. She didn't know but wanted to get out of there. So we kept on our journey to the dock with the unnatural growling slash rumbling following us, coupled with the heavy paces. I'm terrified at this point, instinctively reaching for my right hip to find a blank space where a holster should be. I had left it in the glove box. I grab my pocket knife and palm it aggressively. The rumbling continues, almost impacting the air with its weight. We hasten our pace, and it matches ours, but never coming out of the woods to show itself. This continues for about 300 yards. The entire time, I am absolutely terrified. I've been hunting and camping since I was six, and I've never heard a sound like this one, or even had an experience similar. Finally arriving to the dock, she sprints out to the edge and I grab a handful of rocks and go sit beside her. For the next 15 minutes, it circles the area around the dock landing, emanating the rumbles and growls. Nothing we can do. It's dark. We have no form of weaponry and we can't see. I call my buddy Dennis, who lives five minutes away. The rumbling and pacing continues roughly 30 to 40 yards away from us, but it doesn't step foot on the dock. Finally, I see headlights come up over the trees and the rumbling fades into the darkness. Dennis comes walking down, cradling a rifle. And that was the end of that. Really freaked me out for a few months. I am a believer in cryptozoology now. I don't know if Bigfoot exists, but something does that may be similar especially considering that most cultures have their monsters. This was over 10 years ago, 
and I still remember it quite vividly. I had just gotten out of an emotionally abusive relationship and was dealing with some pretty heavy depression, a level of which I had never experienced before and was quite hard to crawl out of. The situation back at home wasn't any better. So as a small escape, I would go out for late night walks with my sister. We never wandered too far, the cops never stopped us or asked us what we were doing at two and three in the morning. It was weird, but we felt safe enough. One evening, we made our way to the local 7-Eleven just a few blocks away. To get to this place, we had to cross a short bridge over an irrigation canal. This canal is known for having bats roosting underneath. And we would see them occasionally fly out to catch insects. We're just chatting about various things. My sister and I make our way to the 7-Eleven to get our drink. Neither of us had a lot of money. So when we were out, we would get the largest drink offered and share it between ourselves. On the walk back home, we were approaching the bridge once more. And I look up and see the shadowed form of a dog. It was huge, much larger than a German Shepherd or Siberian Husky would be. It was moving towards us. The odd thing was, there were no sounds of footfalls or the telltale signs of claws upon cement. I've never seen a spirit before, and since it was approaching a street lamp and still had no reflection of its eyes, my sister directed us to the median that partitioned the different lanes of traffic. There were no cars out. We were the only ones on the street that night, and we moved to the median to continue our walk since there were sidewalks on only one side of the road, and that's where the dog was. My sister said to leave it be and to not look at it. It won't bother us. I walked several steps, then looked back anyway. The dog was gone, even as we passed it. If it had sprang into a run, I should have heard the animal's footfalls, but there weren't any. I'm not sure what I saw, but it was a little while before we went out again. This first story takes place in the Chuska Mountains in the 80s. My friend was about six years old and was up in the mountains for a family reunion at the family cabin. The cabin is in a meadow with a stone well near the tree line. They spent the day doing typical reunion things like three-legged races, flag football and whatnot. The sun starts setting and the families retire to the cabin and call it a day. The older people planned to sleep in the two bedrooms and the kids would sleep on bed slash cots set up in the living room. All was well and the kids were tucked into bed. My friend Sandra is uneasy and is reluctant to go to sleep. She is wide awake and everyone falls asleep. Sandra tosses and turns, unable to shake her strange feeling, when suddenly her feeling turns immediately to fear as she hears something big, something heavy, making its way across the porch. Sandra fears that it may be a bear looking for food. Little did she know, it would be much worse. She could make up the shadow of something large and dark as it passes the window. It is making its way to the door, and she sees that the family don't lock the door. She is watching it, too scared to move or scream, and she sees the doorknob rattle back and forth. Whatever is trying to open the door, succeeds. And the room floods with the most putrid stench, and she sees a large human hand make its way through the door. Sandra finally summons her strength and screams, Dad! Her father runs in and sees Sandra pointing at the door. He sees the hands and runs to the door and yells, Hank, grab the gun! Whatever was at the door, runs. It was a full moon, and in the moonlight they see the creature run across the yard. Hank, with a hunting rifle in hand, looks through the scope and sees the creature crouching behind the well. Sandra's father assumes it's a bear and tells Hank to shoot. Hank pulls the trigger and hears the bullet ricochet off the well. 
all thought of this being a bear is diminished instantly when the creature stands up on two feet and runs towards the tree line. They never saw the creature again. I was walking into a spot where I duck hunt. It had snowed several days before and had frozen and thawed a few times. So there was a really thick crust on the snow. I'm a big guy and could easily walk on top without breaking through. As I walked along a farm path, I heard something in the forest to my right. Looking, I noticed a shape maybe 30 yards away trying to hide behind a tree line. I could see it clearly. It kept sliding to the left and peering around the tree trunk. I stopped and turned towards it, and it turned and ran away downhill, crossed the upper end of the frozen beaver pond breaking through the ice, crossed an open field on the other side and disappeared into the woods. I lost sight of it before it broke through the ice. It scared me. Shaking, I drew my pistol and made my way back into the field on the far side of the beaver pond and looked at the muddy tracks where it came out of the water. There were just smudges. It wasn't even denting the packed forest snow. I went down to the water and looked at the broken ice. It was thick enough for me to stand on, and I tried. I went back to the tree that I was trying to hide behind, and there was a limb that was across its face, so I knew I could get a height estimate. That limb was even with the top of my head when I was standing, where it had stood. I'm six foot, so this thing must have been at least six foot six or taller. What was it? It was bipedal, standing at six foot six. Maybe it was a person. What could possibly make a human cross a frozen pond in cold 10 degree Fahrenheit weather? not knowing if the ice would support them or not, or even how deep the water was. Then, when did this now very wet person go in a 300 acre forest? There is still a logical explanation. I just don't know what it is. I had a seriously strange encounter last night. I ordered a frozen yogurt from Postmates which is a food delivery service, at around 10.45pm. At around 11.20, I received a notification that the delivery driver was close, so my girlfriend and I stood at the curb waiting for our food. I was immediately surprised to see that my delivery guy was driving a brand new Jaguar. I have never seen a Postmates delivery driver in such an expensive car, as I'm sure many of you probably haven't seen either. The driver also had a young, seemingly normal looking man as a passenger. When the driver got out, he moved bizarrely slow, and the entirety of his eyes were black. It were as if his pupils had expanded to cover the entirety of the visible area of his eyeball. The worst part, however, was that everything that this guy did was horrifyingly creepy. I have never met a creepier individual. When he exited the car, he said something along the lines of, I was in the neighborhood and thought I'd stop by. This statement made no sense because I had just ordered food from him. Also, the guy put my frozen yogurt in the trunk. Keep in mind the item is small enough to fit into a cup holder. So why would he put it in the trunk? when it can easily fit right by him. Then he slowly fished around the trunk for my yogurt. My girlfriend said he stopped what he was doing, looked up and stared at her with what she described as an extremely creepy grin for a significant amount of time. I was looking somewhere else at this point because I just thought the guy was weird and wanted to keep my contact with him to a minimum. I chalked up the creepiness to the guy being socially off, and the eyes to a medical condition. However, my girlfriend was absolutely petrified and told me about these black-eyed people she'd heard about. 
I don't know what his deal was, but I'd rather never see him or anyone like that again. As a kid, I always had these dreams of black-eyed children, knocking on my front door asking to use my phone. They started off fairly polite, but as the dreams occurred more often, they got very demanding about it. There were things about my dreams that always stumped me. My dad's car would be parked somewhere differently than normal. It wouldn't be there at all, or be where it should not be. After a while, I started waking up and actually opening the door to let them in. And wherever my dad's car was in the dream, it actually was. I always fell asleep before he got home, so I'd have no way of knowing if he was actually home from work or not, let alone exactly where his car was parked. That's basically where it ended as a kid. I just had those really vivid dreams and always remember feeling uneasy in that house. Fast forward about 15 years later, and I'm having those same dreams again, except they won't come near the house and just stand in my yard at my bedroom window. They ask the normal questions, if they can come in, if they can use the phone, and it's always the same story where my mum needs to know where they are, and it's the same kids from my childhood dreams. It always ends up saying, soon, and then they're gone. So just tonight I start feeling really uneasy, as if someone's watching me as I'm walking to work, which is odd because I live in a nice area and never get that vibe. Well, as I get a bit further down the road, I go into a full-blown panic attack, for no reason, and I see this kid standing at the overpass, down the road from my house in the pitch black, as I was using my phone for a flashlight. I get closer and he asks if he can use my phone, so I hop on my skateboard and just take off. I hear him say again loudly, we weren't lying, and then he vanishes out of nowhere. Immediately, my uneasy feeling goes away, and my panic attack stops. Do these spirits, or whatever the hell they are, sometimes latch onto people? It's been a long time since I last experienced any of this. I thought it was over, but apparently not. A long time ago, I worked from a high security prison facility that was very isolated and covered by woods. I didn't work here long, but there were a few times when I would chat with inmates and they'd tell me stories of the things that they would hear in the night. Sometimes they would hear the sounds of crashing in the woods, the equivalent of a bulldozer pulverizing trees with no mercy on its endless pursuit of who knows what. Some nights they wouldn't be able to sleep, and when they'd report it to the guard, the guard would be just as scared, but at least they were inside and not out there. There'd be times where they would hear howls in the night, almost unfathomable sounds that they couldn't think could be created by either man or known animal. Safe to say, the prisoners were quite scared to be there. It only took a few weeks before I heard something myself. I was outside having a smoke break, when out of nowhere, this howl emerges from the forest. It's a sound the likes of which I've never heard. I found it utterly terrifying. I still don't know what could make that sound, but I have been told that elk makes some pretty funky noises, but after listening to some recordings, it definitely wasn't that. It was way, way scarier. It's not like that sound is something you'd forget. In any case, after about two months of working there, the spooky vibes took control, and I chose to leave. Best decision I ever made. I live in rural Vermont, and I am an amateur author. It's my hobby, you could say. But I've been interested in black-eyed kids for quite some time, and wanted to write a book about it. 
However, I've been doing research on them for about a week now, and two nights ago my wife and I were awoken by a knock on the front door at about 2.40am. It was a pretty loud knock, not smashing, just three loud thuds. I told my wife I'd go downstairs and check it out. However, when I got closer to the door, I had an odd sensation of fear come over me. It was very strange. I can't really explain the feeling. I hesitated for a moment, but then I buckled up and opened the door. And to my surprise, it was just a kid. At first, I thought it was the neighbor's kid who lived down the street, as he's roughly the age of 13 to 14. He had his head down and was wearing a dark gray hoodie. And I asked him kind of angrily what he wanted. He then continued to stand there and said nothing. I raised my voice and asked him what his name was. That's when he looked up at me. I don't believe I've ever felt fear like that before in my life. His eyes were completely black, not to mention his very pale skin. I slammed the door in his face, locked and then deadbolted. This was definitely not my neighbor's son. I then proceeded to run back upstairs, right by the wife and lock the window to see if he was gone. And he was, just like that, gone. I've barely gotten any sleep and can't stop thinking about this and just can't make sense of it. I've since stopped all research for obvious reasons, but I thought I would share this experience with you and see if you guys have any thoughts on it. As a kid, I saw a fair share of paranormal activity, but this is one that has left me puzzled. As a child, me and my siblings all shared one room, two bunk beds for them and a kid's bed for me, pushed right under the window of our room. I vividly remember waking up one night, probably five or six years old, to a pitch black room. As I laid in bed terrified of the dark, I got an overwhelming feeling or compulsion to look out my window. And when I did, I saw a massive black dog standing at the road, directly under the seemingly only streetlight that was working. As I was staring at this dog, it turned its head towards me, and I saw it had red eyes. It stared directly back at me for what felt like forever before turning to face ahead again. And then the street light flickered and went out and I could no longer see the glow of his eyes. No more than a minute later, the street light turned and in place of the dog was now a very tall man around seven feet tall, all features completely obscured by darkness aside from one thing red eyes that looked directly at me for ages before he walked away. As he walked down the road though, he gradually hunched over more and more until he turned back into the large dog. I've told this story exactly the same for years and years to anyone that listens, but I can't find any information as to what this could be. I'm going to try and give as many details as possible. I live in Ohio around Youngstown, and my family owns a cabin in Pennsylvania, near the Allegheny Forest. It's my grandpa's cabin, and he's a retired firefighter. Years ago, he and his firefighter friends would go hunting in the forest. His friends stayed in a tree stand while the rest were spread out amongst the property and various stands. Around lunchtime, they planned to meet up and eat. Calling the friend, he wouldn't answer for anyone over any sort of walkie-talkie or anything. They decided to meet up and go check on him. They found him petrified, hiding duck down in the stand. They said small trees looked like they'd been snapped with ease. He was as white as a ghost. He claimed there was a large, estimated eight foot tall humanoid creature that stunk so bad he had been tearing down trees left, right and center and walked under the stand. So tall, 
His head almost touched it. He had no idea what it was, and in all his years of hunting, he had never seen anything like it. He didn't know what to think of it. My grandpa is very skeptical, and wouldn't make up this story for no reason whatsoever. It just makes you think. I've had something very bizarre and scary happen the other day. My wife and I were taking our dogs out for a run. Call me weird, but one of the most beautiful spots in our town is the cemetery. We take her there once a week to run around in the area. Don't worry, she doesn't go on graves or anything like that. So everything is going good. We get there and let the dog out and go park in the usual spot. She comes running back very fast and I can tell she seems spooked. Okay, odd, because she always wants to run to every tree and smell it. And normally it's a pain in the ass to get her ready to leave. So we figured we should head out and find a different spot to let her run. On our way out, we see an oddly shaped rock on top of the ridge just outside the cemetery. My wife stopped the car so we could get a better look, but something felt odd. My wife gives out a little whistle to confirm it was nothing, and it lifts its head. She whistles once more, a little louder than the first time, and it turns around and looks at us. This person, or whatever it seemed to be at the moment, just sat there with its head cocked in our direction. The face, no joke, looked like a dog. A big, brown dog with a long snout, yet the dog had arms and looked like it was using a smartphone. This overwhelming sense of fear came over me, and I tell my wife to drive and get out of there fast. I swear on my life, I've seen this with my own eyes. It's crazy the fear you can feel when you see something you simply cannot explain. I plan on going back on my days off and see if I can find some evidence. I want to share a story my dad has been telling my family for a long time. This took place in 2003, 15 years ago. We used to live in Mexico, more specifically in Mexicali, Baja California. We lived in an urban area. This story is a bit different since he saw a woman instead of a child, but nonetheless, I'm sure it's the same thing. One afternoon after my father was doing his usual stuff, he heard knocking on the door. He quickly answered and was met with a Caucasian woman, a bit on the chubby side wearing some really old clothes that looked handmade and clearly weren't from this time period. She told him, Me da agua, senor? which translates to, can I have some water? My father replied with, there's a hose round the side. But the woman insisted on coming in. My father told her no. So she looked at him straight in the eyes. And that's where my dad saw it. Her eyes were completely black. She walked to the side of the house and proceeded to defecate on the sidewalk. My father lost track of her after that. And the next thing that happened was a bit strange. From that day onward for about a month, an owl would constantly fly and stand on the same place where she had done a duty. And that's all of the story. My father isn't usually a superstitious fellow. And even though it may sound a little bizarre, he's always told the same story. 15 years ago, I lived in a town in Indiana. Where we lived was in the country a few miles away from town. There were a few weird things that happened. So first off, I woke up at 3am and had a strong urge to go to my window when I opened the blinds and saw yellow eyes. And it was as if it were piercing through my soul. I felt instant hopelessness and fear, then turned around and went back to bed. I'm 100% sure I wasn't dreaming when the morning came and I went to the area I saw the eyes and didn't see any footprints. The following night, I was standing on my porch and suddenly smelt rotting flesh. 
the worst thing I've ever smelt, and proceeded to hear crunching leaves. To my left, I see a very large black dog walking towards my home. I screamed and ran inside that night, and I heard scratching on the side panels of our home. The following day, I found a large patch of fur, probably four by four, in the same area where I had seen the large dog, but the fur was white with gray instead of black. I called this thing a dog, but it was dark. I looked at this thing for long enough to determine it wasn't a deer and freaked out and ran. I knew it was tall and on all fours. We lived at that house for another year, and there were still some mornings I would smell the rotting flesh. There have also been weird instances where I've spoken about this and phones will glitch out or the phone line will cut. Maybe I'm reading too much into it, but it was spooky. I didn't even know what I saw until a few months ago. I was drinking with friends, and one of them tells me a story, and he starts going on about skinwalkers. So, who knows? There was this one encounter I had that really stands out among everything that's happened to me. I was hiking the ridges above Raton. I'd been out quite a while when I came across a well picked over deer carcass. There weren't any fresh tracks around it, but that's a real clear identification that I'm on some large predator's home turf. Time to go. As I'm climbing down the ridge, not the way I came up, mind you, I see a flat area with an odd round stone formation. Think Stonehenge, but the rocks aren't squared off. Each of the rocks are taller than I am, and formed a darn near perfect circle. I'm a little creeped out, but I step in for a closer look. The second I crossed through the rocks, it was like an electric shock. Immediate goosebumps. The hair on my neck is standing up, and every nerve in my body is screaming at me to be somewhere else right now. I scrambled down the rest of the ridge, way out of control. I was lucky not to hurt myself at some point, because I was just jumping without looking where I was going, and I didn't look back once. Twenty years on, I still can't explain my reaction. I've not given to extreme flights of fancy. I'm not afraid of things that go bump in the night, and I'm not religious and don't believe in evil with a capital E. But I did that day. Something horrific happened there once, and it will happen again. Stay out of the woods. I was camping on a reservation, and walked up to the lake from the campground. It was a 20 minute walk to the lake. To the left, there was a destroyed and decaying elevated wooden path through a dead swamp, and to the right, the pipe from the water station at a lake. When we got to the lake, all the animal noises had stopped. The lake was tannin stained and pitch black. The trees were all burned or dead, and the dock was floating, not attached to anything. We went on the dock, and I stayed there while the other two went and took the crappy one oar rowboat out to the water. The whole time it was absolutely silent, and my gut was screaming danger. It took them a while to paddle back to the dock, but they were freaking out too. So we hightailed it out of there, and once we were halfway back, we left the silence and immediately heard birds. I took a few steps back and it was basically silence. First few steps forwards, and birds. Not exactly a Bigfoot encounter I know, but creepy nonetheless, and there are Bigfoot sightings and reports around all the time I was there. It is said that if a Bigfoot is in the area, Everything will go quiet, because they are afraid of it, and know it's there. I think that's probably what happened. This isn't my story per se, but is my mother's. My mother owns a salon in country suburbia, Philadelphia. I have been working for her since she opened, and I'm usually with her Wednesdays through Saturdays. Every Saturday, 
We have an older woman come in. We'll call her Ethel. Ethel usually washes her own hair, then sets it up to come and have it teased. It's literally a $4 service, and seems weird, but she's there every week for the same thing. I've never gotten a weird vibe from her, and have spent years talking to this woman. A few years ago, I left work early with her closing up for the day. I felt safe knowing my mum only had one more client, and it would be no big deal. She's only there for a maximum of 10 more minutes. As I get home, I get a call from my mother, who's shaken up, but not terrified. She goes on to tell me that she was doing Ethel's hair, and she uncharacteristically turned around and looked at my mum. When their eyes met, she said that they were completely black, no whites at all. And as my mum looked back into the mirror, her eyes were normal again. It hasn't happened again, and this was the first time I'd heard of it, and I honestly dismissed it for the most part, until I came across a humanoid encounter that led me to these stories. Now, I believe I will stay late just to see Ethel and speak to her. This is a second-hand story that's been told to me by long-time legit cowboys, but is also corroborated with a newspaper story. In the southeastern High Sierra, there is a river called the South Fork of the Kern, and it's a good-sized river. The Pacific Crest Trail crosses the river on a huge metal footbridge that must be repaired by Forest Service personnel every few years. One time during repairs, the men were interrupted by a horrendously loud bellowing scream. They turned to look towards the scream, and supposedly right there was a freaking Bigfoot in all his glory. The men were armed, and they supposedly shot at it, but it didn't do much as they booked it out of there and never returned. I've been on this bridge many times, and have camped in the area all my life, as well as with my father. One time about 10 years after the bridge event, my dad was camping in the area with his friend. One night, my dad was awoken by something walking around the tent. Now for context, that tent is about 8 foot tall in the middle. My dad says something pushed down on the top of the tent, directly down and then walked off. He tried to wake his buddy up, but he slept through it. I'm not saying it was a Bigfoot, but with those events being so close, I don't know, man. It scares me a little. I didn't believe in black-eyed kids until just recently. Two of them came to my window. I live half underground, and my window is at ground level right above my bed. It is storming pretty good, and I had my blinds up watching the lightning, and then suddenly two of them walked right up to the window, like a horror movie, and knocked. Slowly but sternly. I shot out of bed, drew the shade, and heard them say, Please let us in. We're cold. Can we use your phone? Immediately, I shouted for them to leave, but they didn't move. Recalling what I had read about them possibly being demons, I yelled as loudly as I could, Get away from here. Leave now. This is a house of God. Or something like that. I kept yelling until the knocking stopped. I was scared out of my wits. And then finally, one made eye contact through the crack in the shutters. And sure enough, its eyes were as black as could be. Like I was getting lost in the blackness, and could not look away. And then they were gone. I'm honestly so terrified, and shaking. I really wish I had never learned of these Satan spawns. About two years ago, my best friend and I were driving home from late night classes. We live in a rural area and take these roads daily. We've had a few strange encounters on these roads, but this one stuck with me. It was pretty dark and we were going about 40 miles an hour. 
I never drive faster than that on these roads because of deer and other wildlife. The road has a few houses, so it wasn't completely wooded. I'm driving alone and see some eyes and a dark figure that resembled a dog. I stopped the car to let it cross the road. It runs across the road and at the edge of the bank and stands on its hind legs and runs like a human. My friend and I are scared because of how creepy this was. We tried to register what we saw and decided that it wasn't possibly a dog. It may have been something else. It was too small and skinny to be a bear. All I can conclude is that I saw a skinny canine creature running across the road, then stand on its hind legs and run into the wood. I went out to a forest with my uncle one evening. We were going to go night hunting, but it got cut short due to what we witnessed. We were just there for deer. An hour or so passed, and it was getting quite dark in the woods. While we were making our way around the woods, I heard a grunting noise nearby. It creeped me out for a second, and my uncle suggested it was probably just a wild boar. I turned around with my flashlight to see if there were any signs of nearby boar. What my light fell upon horrified me. The light from my flashlight fell upon an eye of a huge tall creature which appeared to be squatting. I grabbed my uncle's arm as I was scared as hell. My uncle told me to stay back and we slowly backed away. The creature also backed away. I genuinely believe I saw a Sasquatch that night. My brother-in-law was hunting in the hill countryside outside of Austin as a teen. He was watching for an area of deer. There was a clearing with some rocks, and it was early morning, so it was pretty dark. He could mostly see silhouettes. At some point, one of the rocks stood upright and walked away. Turns out it wasn't a rock. He to this day believes it was a Sasquatch. He said it made him absolutely crap his pants. He also acknowledged it could have been some crazy homeless guy living in the woods. You know, given that Austin wasn't that far away. <laughs> 